All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session um, on the modern NLP, learning to apply the real use cases. And we have uh, Leonardo Di Marchi here with us. So I'll be your moderator. My name is Aishwarya. I'm uh, working as a data scientist at Cisco. So yeah, uh, to, to uh, tell a brief uh, bio about uh, Leo. So he holds a master's in uh, AI and has worked as a data scientist in the sports world with clients such as New York Knicks and Manchester United and with large social networking like Just Giving. He's currently heading the data science and analytics team at a financial startup called Stealth. Uh, he provides consultancy and training for small and large companies, and his previous experiences include uh, being a head of data science and analytics in Bumble, one of the largest dating sites with over 500 million users. So he headed the team through the acquisition and an IPO. So he's also a lead instructor at uh, idea.io, which is a company specialized in uh, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and machine learning training. So yeah, in the academic world, he has also helped set up the PhD Center on Interactive AI and will be taking part in the Inner Assessment Board to assign funding uh, to Irish research in artificial intelligence. So I'm le uh, leaving the stage on to uh, Leo. So yeah, we can get started. Great, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, thank you for, for, for the introduction. Uh, I also... Um, uh, starts just by explaining a little bit the structure of the course. As you see in the chat, you have you see two links uh, at the very top. One is the, uh, the the slides, so the NLP. You can see all the slides we're going to go through, and then you have the online course, which is a collection of uh, collab notebooks. So if you don't know what a collab notebook is, it's just uh, like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, that you can run in the cloud. So if you open the first one, uh, what I will ask you to do, and I, I, re I will repeat when we go through the through the first one, is to uh, duplicate the, uh, the the notebook in your drive. So save copy in drive. In this way, you'll be able to run everything to modify, and you can always go back to mine and uh, and see the original version. Uh, and um, uh, you're also able to, to select uh, uh, how to run it. Uh, so if you want to run it with the GPU or CPU and so on, it will be good to run it with the with GPU for the latest stage when we are talking about deep learning. Uh, and um, uh, what else? Ah, yeah, there is a, a data folder that you also need to uh, to copy and to to copy your own. Uh, uh, in your own Google Drive. Uh, so yeah, feel free to start it by, be the easiest way is just download it and then uh, upload it in your own Google Drive. Um, does everyone has access to, to uh, Google Drive? If not, please uh, raise your hand in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, what's the name? in Zoom. Okay, Howard, okay, two people. Um, do you, uh, if you, is it a problem for you to create a, a Google account? And uh, that will, uh, will automatically give you access to Google Drive so you don't need, uh, you really don't need anything else. You can also, I can also provide this uh, as, a, um, as a file, a Jupyter notebook file. So you should still be able to, to run it and visualize it. You will have to, un to install the dependencies, but other than that. Um, uh, excuse me. Sorry, yes. most of us don't have the link to the um, page. Okay, let's see chat um, if you go on the very top of the chat you should um, be able to the to problem is that i joined a bit late so i don't have access to the beginning ah, okay question. i thought i yeah. thought the history was for everyone i will i will i will uh, post it again 
now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so these are the notebooks. Slides. I can also put it in the in a, in, a, in one of the slides, so we, we always have it. Mm. Just gonna add this here. Okay, it doesn't look very good, but at least you have both links. So, should be enough. So now I'm gonna share the, the first slide. So I try to make a sense of with the, with the numbers on when to start um, and when to, um, um so well the, just just so when you when you look at it on your own you will see uh, some some kind of logic so of course is zero one two three and then we have a bunch of fours and then fives just because uh in in the in the four we have a, f a couple of more uh, um a couple of more uh, uh jupiter notebooks but everything is more or less consistent so you should be able to to navigate it relatively easy and yes i'm gonna share again the link I th mm. so let's start with the first slide again okay just share the game the first slide and i'm gonna share the jupyter notebook when uh, when uh, we're gonna start to to work on that so if everything is fine now just going to start with a, with a brief introduction and what I like to do is also to give uh, a little bit of a, uh, an overview on uh, what's, what's happening, not just in NLP, but also in, uh, in data science. The reason is because uh, I'm not uh, specializing in NLP, I'm what, what people call uh, a generalist. I'm, uh, I did maybe more uh, uh, computer vision and uh, reinforcement learning and traditional machine learning. Uh, but at the end, you will see that the more you see these algorithms and these techniques, the more you understand that at the end is always a, a, a slightly different ways of looking at data. Uh, the transformation you do, the algorithm you do, it's like you're trying to project some lights across a blob of data. And depending on how well you are able to uh, change the orientation of this data, you'll be able to uh, arrive to a, a, a better conclusion. I think it's very important to have a broad understanding of, uh, of machine learning uh, because it's very, very, very often you will pick uh, uh, some techniques from one field and apply to a different one. And the more we grow, the more we have complex algorithms, the more these techniques seems more similar and uh, hopefully they should converge into a, a one uh, technique that is can, can be called like the general uh, artificial intelligence where we have an algorithm that is able to um, to to learn different things in a seamless way uh, just a, a bit of my background so i work for uh for a few companies uh some sports companies like new york Knicks, manchester united uh, some uh, uh, big social networks like just giving and bumble and then some uh, uh, some governments. Uh, so I work for the European Commission, Ireland, Latvia. Uh, at the moment, uh, I work with the Stealth Financial Organization, and I also work uh, on my with my own company. So IDEI, uh, this is the, the, the my my own company. I provide trainings uh, and uh, to large companies and also promising startups. And I also do. Uh, very specific projects. So some of the, the presentation I did is for ODSC or ILA. Some of the corporate clients, both on the training and on the solution side is OTE, 
uh, which is the largest company in, uh, in Greece, and uh, New Day, which is the uh, large credit card company in, um, in the UK, and then a few startups like Popsa or uh, um, Apollo AI. I also wrote a book, um, Hands-On Neural Networks, uh, and uh, I started a YouTube channel more than one year ago. I have only one video, but I always hope I will have some time to, um, to uh, create more videos. Uh, so the first video is about pandas and how to uh, make a pandas computation faster. Uh, now, uh, I would just want to reflect a little bit on NLP. Uh, NLP is a particularly interesting domain because it's, it's very human-centric. It starts with linguistic, which is how humans communicate. Uh, it has some, let's say, AI, machine learning, however you want to call it, component. And you also have some computer science component. So the linguistic and AI are pretty self-explanatory. The computer science part is because uh, very often you, we deal with a huge amount of data uh, and uh, the data will be very sparse. So it's also important to uh, do your computation in an efficient way. And uh, NLP understanding, which is really extracting the information out of text um, can be done in, a, in, multiple, uh, in multiple stages. You have the first of a medium understanding. So if you are, now I'm speaking, uh, so the, 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 the medium is, is my voice. And uh, sometimes it's tricky to, to get this right. And sometimes uh, the major effort is to really uh, decode the medium. So then when we have a syntactic analysis, so understanding how, how the sentence is formed with the morphological analysis, then we have a semantic interpretation and we have a, finally a, a discourse. So a, a bot or an entity that is able to communicate seemingly with a, with a human. Now we're gonna focus about semantic interpretation and uh, we're gonna split the course in maybe two main parts. The first part is really the, the foundation of NLP. So we will not use uh, uh, deep learning. And the second part is where we're gonna uh, heavily use uh, deep learning. There are quite a few complexity in NLP. The main one is that uh, we are dealing with unstructured data. And that was the real uh, hard rock that uh, all the uh, previous research in the past uh, 15, 20 years uh, was really derailing the, the, all the efforts of the researchers. Uh, maybe not everyone was uh, like, but not, 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 you're, you're not, um, let's say, aware of, of the history of an LP. Uh, and I can say 10 years ago, it was a very, very sad industry. I remember going to conferences and seeing people really sad because uh, They've been trying to, uh, to make something work for the past 10, 15, or 20 years with very little result. The main, re the main reason is because uh, they were tackling unstructured data uh, in a, mostly in a statistical manner and in a um, grammatical manner. So there were some uh, rules that uh, the researcher were trying to force on a text uh, and uh, getting some statistic out of it. So it will be always have a probabilistic component, uh, but really it was not the best way to represent, to represent the data. And uh, the first real breakthrough on that side was a uh, word to vec, which is when we start having a, a, a let's say a domain free representation of text. So I'm not gonna, just deep, deep dive on one specific field, for example, law or uh, Twitter feeds or medical, uh, medical systems to get their, uh, 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 their main uh, ways of uh, representing the, the structure of, uh, of, of the language, but we will try to create something more generic. Then, then we can customize later on. The other complexity, the communication is very complex. Like we are not, 
great at uh, communicating with each other, even when we write things down, it's very, uh, it's very easy to misunderstand something because we cannot provide all the context, we cannot uh, put a lot of, uh, of things that are much easier in other domains like computer vision. Also, things are interpretable. One word has multiple meanings and uh, multiple shades of that, of that meaning. There are a lot of special cases. There are some mistakes that everyone makes. And as I said, we lack the context uh, and, and many more actually. So it's a more challenging problem uh, compared to, for example, computer vision, where you can have uh, uh, the same image. Uh, it's uh, mostly country independent. So it doesn't, you don't care about where it was taken. You don't need the context is mostly there. Uh, and uh, you can create more generic algorithm in a much easier way. There are a lot of different tasks that NLP is trying to solve. The first one and the most popular one is search. So Google, of course, uh, was a very popular search engine. Information retrieval is still, is still huge. Uh, check the spelling. Like Grammarly is providing for free their models. On, uh, on, uh, in open source. So if you go to Hugging Face or GitHub, you'll be able to find the uh, uh, spell check models already trained for you and the architecture. Also extracting information uh, like name entity recognition can be quite challenging. The classical example is Michael Jordan. Are we talking about the basketball player or, or, the, um, or, or the Stanford professor? Chatbots is a very extremely popular one and is becoming more and more popular. Uh, sentiment classification, machine translation, and, and so on. There are so many of these tasks that now are really in our everyday life, in our phones, in our home, like with Alexa, um, basically every way in our life. Uh, now I'd like to, to do a, a pool uh, and I will start first with uh, one question, so feel free to write in the chat or just uh, uh, unmute yourself and tell what you would like to get out of today's course, because we have quite a bit of material and uh, I can, uh, I, I can uh, tailor a little bit what we're gonna see in these, uh, in these four hours. So feel free to write either in the chat or, uh, or with the video, uh, sorry, with the audio. Sentiment analysis, latest NLP advancement and uh, state of the art, text classification in emails, hugging face, uh, the terminology understand semantics, um, brief intro to application and next steps, chatbots. Okay, I see there are, uh, as, as I can see, there are a lot of different uh, interests here. Uh, also NLP expert from business product program owner. Uh, what do you need to understand? I think these are a lot of great answers and uh, it's also a testament on how many, um, how many different uh, applications we, we, we have um, in an auto and auto and ML hugging face. So we have uh, a lot of stuff we can, uh, we can do. Which is great. I'm just gonna get back to uh, maybe other question, and this one is uh, uh, by uh, I would like you to answer by raising your hand. Uh, it's just to understand your level. Let's say, uh, would you classify yourself as a, an NLP expert? If so, please raise your hand. And uh, when I say raise your hand, is in the uh, Zoom. Uh, it's a Zoom functionality. Okay, second question. Would you consider yourself a novice? Again, if so, please raise your hand. Okay. Quite a few people are starting out which is totally fine. It's actually a great moment to, to start working with, with NLP. Uh, so now uh, I will probably for what, what I saw, I will, I will try to give a little bit of everything. We'll have the last part 
uh, as the for the more advanced topics, uh, deep learning, hugging face. Uh, the first part will be the foundations, and if you actually, if you actually, uh, actually you, after you finish the course, you will see that at the end they don't differ that much. It's just different ways of accomplishing the same thing, and this is why we still need uh, to understand the, the previous steps. Uh, when, like, let's say, the more manual uh, machine learning, because uh, it's still the foundation for for everything else. We have uh, uh, four hours, more or less. I would like to divide that in uh, four parts, with uh, uh, five ten minutes uh, break after each part. So let's say at uh, three fifty five, we're gonna have the first break, and then. Uh, in, in uh, the next hour, uh, same and so on. So we have uh, enough time to uh, regroup and, uh, and uh, start fresh. Also, as you see, if you just join, I, I share two different, uh, uh, two different um, uh, links. Uh, I will share them again at the end. It's mostly how I divided the course. So we have one part, which is presentation led and the other part, which is hands-on. I will alternate the two. So I'm gonna start with some presentation to give some concepts, and then we are gonna go through the uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, uh, collab, uh, collab notebooks, uh, uh, so you can have a, a real taste on what it takes to, uh, to, to solve these tasks. And uh, at any time, feel free to say something. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult the, to do the four hours in a course like that. So don't worry about formalities. Feel always free to interrupt. I'll try to look at the chat, uh, but if, if, if you need uh, something, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, it's actually breaking uh, the, the, the monotony of, uh, of these uh, of these presentations, so I'll be happy to do it. Cool. So now we got everything uh, out of the way, and we start with the more uh, the the machine learning introduction. So we have, let's say, three more types of uh, machine learning: supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is by far the most popular, and I'm sure you are all familiar with. You believe you have some inputs. You have some outputs, and we are trying to create a model that is able to connect the two. These models should be able also to score new inputs in a, in a consistent way. So we are trying not to, uh, to overfit our model uh, in, in so we can uh, expand the, the learnings uh, outside of the data set that we have. And this is more or less the essence of supervised learning. There are a lot of applications. Computer vision is a very easy and immediate one to see. Uh, you see an image, you need to classify what's inside the image. And uh, to start with, you provide uh, uh, the image as an, out, as an input and uh, the output that you expect, which is the, uh, what, what's inside the image. In, super, in NLP, also supervised learning is quite a common task. Uh, and it usually goes through a, uh, representation. Uh, so you have uh, an input, maybe from uh, from an email. You need to decide if that email is a spam or not. Once you transform the words into numbers, which is the huge part and is probably the most important part, uh, you can use a, classi a classifier uh, to determine which is um, uh, which email is what. So your, your output, if in this case you have a certain percentage, a certain probability of being a spam and a certain probability of being not spam. And this is where things start to go into, get interesting, especially with the latest development, because what deep learning is, is uh, basically a, a, um, a, a, the, one of the best ways of creating these representations uh, in a, in a uh, non-human manner. So uh, a few years ago, when the, there was a very sad time for, for NLP researchers, a, research will, a researcher will have to really understand the domain, uh, create uh, some sort of mathematical mapping between words and numbers, and then use that with the classifier. 
now we have uh, uh, word to vec we have BERT, we have uh, a lot of algorithms that uh, provide this representation and create this representation almost autonomously. We still need to provide some uh, or quite a bit of text, but then uh, a lot of the things that are happening uh, happens without uh, needing a, um, a heavy, um, heavy involvement of the researcher. After your representation, again, you can have a classifier and your classifier can be part of the same network, can be a different network, can be a support vector machine, a logistic regression, whatever you want. And then you have the output. Also, uh, unsupervised is a big part of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, you, in this case, you just have an input and your model is trying to find pattern and proximity of your data. Using this proximity, the model is able to identify uh, different clusters. Now, this is used uh, for uh, LDA, for example. Uh, so topic modeling, which is something that we're gonna, we're gonna see, but it's also used in uh, semi-supervised learning, which is something that uh, it goes uh, in training models um, like BERT or other uh, deep learning models. So usually have a lot of, a huge amount of text uh, and uh, use the this text to create uh, some vector space. And then you use the supervised part to connect the words to this vector space. And you can obtain more or less the same thing. Uh, this was what unlocked a lot of potential about on, on, on NLP, this way of uh, decoupling the task of uh, finding the representation and then finding uh, a way to use this representation for a classification task. We also have generative models and generative models are still uh, uh, some sort of unsupervised learning. Uh, the main difference that we have with, with other algorithms is that instead of learning uh, a, a line that discriminates different classes. Uh, so as you see in this example, we have uh, uh, white dots and blue dots. We need, just need to a uh, good way to separate these two. With generative models, we are learning the uh, distributions of these dots. So they can still be used as a, a discriminatory uh, algorithm, but what is powerful about it is that you can sample on this distribution and this will, uh, will uh, um, make you able to create new sentences or new faces that are looks like humans, but are not humans or create uh, your uh, your data, uh, so if you don't have enough data, uh, there is an argument of you using generative network to create, create additional data sets. And uh, a, a common approach for generative data sets is our GANs, uh, but also we're gonna see uh, quite a few, quite a few algorithms in, the, in, in NLP. The concept is always the same. Uh, you're able to separate the representation and then the discrimination. Uh, in this way, with the generative adversarial networks, you can have an algorithm that is able to uh, classify if uh, an instance is a, a, a genuine instance, so something, for example, a, a sentence from a book or a sentence that was created by a bot. Uh, so if you, if you already have this uh, classifier, this classifier is able to train another network to generate better, better sentences. And uh, the way it does is basically generate something from this uh, uh, statistical distribution. It creates the sentence, it passes it to the classifier and the classifier provides feedback. So this is really the core of many machine learning applications, uh, even transformers, uh, even in unsupervised in uh, reinforcement learning, the latest uh, uh, the latest advancement uh, are uh, because of this separation. What is incredibly interesting is that in this way you are able to separate the the loss function uh, 
from the, the rest of the algorithm and you're actually able to train your own loss function. And this is what really unlocked uh, uh, a, a, a entire world of possibilities and possibly is the, the most important advancement in machine learning in the, in the last 10 years. In NLP, uh, we were gonna see GPT-2 uh, and now uh, it creates a, a paragraph or a, a text with, uh, with some uh, simple inputs. Uh, so most of this is created by, uh, by this algorithm. And uh, sometimes it looks reasonable. Sometimes it just sounds reasonable because the words are in the right place, but they don't make much sense together. It's still quite an interesting uh, uh, application. And I'm sure you're familiar with GPT-3, uh, which is uh, the algorithm that was too dangerous to be released uh, from, from OpenAI. Uh, which was just an advancement on, on GPT-2. GPT uh, and generating, uh, again, when, when you have a generative model, also in NLP, you can do uh, a lot of other things. You can do classification, uh, you can do some inferencing, sentence similarity, question answering, and, and so on. So as you can see here, uh, the the generative part can be used in, uh, in more ways than just a discriminative, uh, the discriminative representation. Uh, and then we have reinforcement learning, which is, I think, is one of the other emerging fields. Uh, and a little bit like uh, NLP is emerging now because it builds on top of a representation that is created by uh, by other algorithms, mostly deep learning algorithms. Computer vision is mostly representation. So you just, if you represent the image in a nice way, you basically your job is, uh, is almost done or I mean, this is the core of it. Well, NLP and reinforcement learning, uh, you need to create a, a representation that makes sense first. Reinforcement learning works in a slightly different way. So you don't have a, a input and output, but you have an agent that you need to train. The agent takes an action. The environment responds to this action, provides the feedback to the agent, and the agent learns a little bit. So in NLP, reinforcement learning can be used for a, a chatbot, uh, this question answering uh, type of problems, uh, text summarization. In general, the action is, so we add this sentence to the summary and then the feedback is yes or no. And again, here, the big advancement is that you can separate the, the way you, have, you learn the representation and the way you learn on how to take action on this representation. So it's very similar to, to the NLP uh, advancements. Again, article summarization is one of the uh, other things you can use NLP, but question answering, dialogue systems, uh, dialogue generation, knowledge base, QA, so your question answering. So you, you provide uh, a set of data, maybe even a, a database, and then you are able to query this database uh, with the questions, so just normal questions. Uh, talking about questions, do you have any, any questions on this introduction or things that you sparkle your attention? Feel free to use the chat or yeah, just unmute yourself. Ah. Okay, see uh, the agent you mentioned, is it a human in the loop? Actually, no. Uh, the agent is uh, everything that is inside our uh, environment that we have control on. So we can tell the agent, uh, do this. You can think about the reinforcement learning as a video game. So the agent is the main character. You tell the agent to uh, jump, uh, to shoot, uh, to hide, and so on. And the environment uh, reply to this, uh, uh, to this uh, action. 
Uh, so the agent is basically learned. And uh, what is also extremely interesting in this in these differentiation that we have, so if you have all these three, uh, supervise and supervise and reinforcement learning, uh, it seems that they differentiate mostly for the, from the source of supervision. Uh, because actually even unsupervised learning has a supervision source. That's the, the human. The human provides a, a an inform provides the algorithm to an information on how good the, the results are. So you the algorithms create clusters, the humans review it, and then it, uh, we use this uh, feedback, this supervision to improve the algorithm. On supervised learning, the source of the supervision is the data. So you will have the output of, uh, of the input we are supposed to have. In reinforcement learning, the source of the supervision is the, the environment itself, because the environment is providing the feedback to the agent and somehow is supervising the, uh, the, um, what, what the agent is, is trying to, uh, to achieve. So what you need to provide in this case is an environment, so a set of uh, results that agent will have uh, and uh, a set of actions that agents can take. Then the reinforcement learning should be able to find a good representation of the environment and decide what is the best action to take. Great. Uh, no worries, Jerry. We have a, a question for Paras. Uh, can you talk about how to create a corpus with a bunch of text CSVs? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the a corpus is just a, a collection of text. Uh, you can have your own. So you, you have uh, maybe your uh, company's data, uh, let's say uh, an, a, a, an agent, a, a, a chatbot that is uh, in, uh, interacting with, uh, uh, with, with your customers, or we have uh, your customers and the customer support that are interacting with each other. So just taking all this conversation and uh, you, you have your, uh, uh, your corpus. There are plenty of open source uh, corpus around. And uh, I strongly suggest to look at uh, seeing uh, an existing corpus that you can use. Uh, the, the big advantage that you have now in, uh, in NLP is that uh, you can use uh, knowledge for a, huge, uh, for a huge corpus like Wikipedia or a terabyte of Twitter data. Uh, or books, uh, and they already are uh, representative in a compact way in an algorithm. For example, you take a pre-trained BERT model, so a model that was trained on, uh, let's say, the whole Wikipedia, and you already have a re representation of that corpus. Then you can fine-tune that. Uh, you can fine-tune the, the uh, BERT algorithm on your specific corpus, which can be much, much smaller. Okay, there was a question for Paras. If you not have any follow-up question, I will go to the next, the next chapter. So the, let me share the slides uh, in the chat. So slides one, now we are looking at uh, a text transformation. So again, this, same can seem trivial now, uh, but this is really the, the 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 basics that you need to also understand uh, uh, all the hugging face model, BERT, because all, all those models are trying to solve this problem here, this text representation. So the the problem is relatively simple. We have some words, uh, but words are not great because I cannot. Uh, make an average of this word, uh, of, the, of this sentence, for example. I cannot take the cat is on the table uh, and have uh, uh, maybe on as an as a average, as a median. Does it make sense? No, because it doesn't give me much information. Uh, can I compare V and cat in this way? I can do some maybe the hemming distance, which is just comparing characters, but it really doesn't give me any information about uh, what I can do. What we know how to do well is supervised learning. So what we would like to have is uh, our numbers 
uh, numbers as an input, some other output can be categorical that you transform in basically numbers or already a regression task, so you, you already have numbers. That's the ideal scenario. That's what we are gonna try to achieve. So we have a, the cat is on the table, we have a model and we need to produce something with this model. As I say, ideally we will transform this sentence in a vector. Traditionally, this was done through, through a pipeline. So you have uh, your text, uh, you segment, you tokenize, uh, which means you have a sentence, you divide this sentence in uh, blocks, can be words, can be part of words. Um, you, you clean the text, uh, maybe you take out uh, exclamation points, uh, errors, uh, dotted lines, things that are not adding uh, information or maybe are, uh, are not easy to, uh, to, to be used. After this, we, you, can, uh, you can use uh, 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 some sort of vectorization. So you transform this text into a vector of numbers. On top of that, you can finally do some, uh, some feature engineering. Then you do lemmatization and, and, and stemming. So uh, you transform words like playing in more standard words because you don't want to have uh, play, plays, playing, played. Uh, it doesn't really give that much information. Uh, so you would like to reduce the dimensionality of your task and use uh, uh, play or play or part of the word uh, to represent all these cases. Then after, after you have a clean representation of your words into vectors, you can do some machine learning. Uh, so you can use a logistic regression to determine if, uh, um, if a slang email is a spam or not. And finally, you can interpret the results and see if, uh, if you are achieving uh, what you are planning to achieve. And this is the first big difference that you're going to see between classical NLP and uh, deep learning. You see, you have uh, uh, pre-processing, modeling, you have a lot of different steps. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, you just have maybe a language detection task to understand if you're if it's uh, English or French uh, or, uh, or uh, Hindu or uh, any other language, uh, find the appropriate uh, algorithms, do the pre-processing, the modeling and so on. So the representation here is uh, uh, hand coded by the researcher most of the time. The researcher is uh, heavily involved in the pre-processing uh, maybe using uh, a dictionary of important words, for example, medical terms, and uh, manually uh, curating what uh, it should uh, be considered a feature from, from our model. In deep learning, all that part is automated. That's the really big uh, advantage of deep learning that all these tasks will be done by an algorithm. So as long as you have a lot of data, you'll be able to, uh, to create a good uh, feature representation because what you have is that you have uh, some neurons. The neurons are connected to each other with uh, uh, weights. And uh, by training the network, you're basically changing these weights and you're finally ending up with a representation of a meaningful pattern that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the training phase was able to detect. Because uh, while you are training, uh, you're cutting out some, uh, some weights or reducing the influence of these weights. So the final layer would be just a representation of all the uh, useful connection and all the useful, uh, the useful uh, information that comes from the input. You can really think about this as uh, switches. So at the beginning, you have all the light here. Then you can you you close some of these windows, 
you kill some other of these windows, you have some mirrors, and then at the end, you only see the patterns that you're really interested in. You will use a classifier on top of this pattern. Most of the time it's part of the neural network, but just because, uh, just to be efficient. Uh, so you can have, let's say a sigmoid or a softmax that does the final classification. But once you have this representation, you can use a, a random forest, for example, or any other algorithm to, uh, uh, to, uh, to classify the, the instance. Because the cool part is that you already have uh, uh, an automated way of creating this representation. Is it, is it all good? I'm just gonna check the chat. All clear? If not, don't worry, raise your hand right on the chat and uh, I, I will, I will, I am very happy to spend a bit more time. So now that we know more or less what we want to achieve, the question is how to achieve it. We have a few different uh, uh, libraries. Actually, at the moment, we have too many libraries that can do almost the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So one of the problems that uh, someone that is starting out uh, might have is that uh, you're a bit overwhelmed about the, all the information and the tools you have at your disposal. So I'm just gonna summarize the most important tools in here. The first one is NLTK, Natural Language Processing Toolkit. Very, very old, but gold as well because it contains uh, a lot of algorithms that uh, uh, our, uh, our researcher needs. So the, the idea of NLTK is something that researchers can use. Um, they don't have embedding, unfortunately, which is this uh, uh, more advanced representation and it's very popular with the academics. On the, other, on the other side, we have Spacey, which is more practical. So it's more for uh, people working in the industry and uh, they favor practicality over completeness. So they have a subset of uh, algorithms that are quite efficient, contrasting uh, and LTK where they try to have as many as they can. It's more modern, so you can feel the, the difference in the, the way it was coded. It has great documentation. Uh, and it also contains word vectors, which is this, uh, this embedding that uh, NLTK uh, doesn't have. Jensen, uh, it's a, an important library, mostly because it was the first one to introduce uh, uh, word to vec uh, So in 2013, uh, I think it was a, a Google uh, research paper in, in collaboration with the uh, Finnish University, published the word to vec papers, which was providing uh, uh, an automated way to create this uh, vectorized representation of words. So what happens is that you have a shallow network. Um, this shallow network has a fake task. So it's not a task that is useful in any way other than create a representation. And uh, for example, the task you might have is to uh, given a context uh, in a sentence, let's say the first, the two words prior a certain word and the two words after, uh, you want to uh, predict the word in the middle. So it's something that you, you actually can create with any text. Uh, so it's very practical. You don't need any human taggers. You, it's just something that can be coded. Uh, and if you do this with a, a shallow neural network, you are then able to create this vectorized representation. And the amazing thing is that this representation will, be, will make sense mathematically. So you have a queen and king, and you can uh, compare the two and do a cosine difference between king and queen and king. Or if you have uh, a mathematical operation like uh, subtraction, let's say uh, king minus man plus woman, if you can do all these op mathematical operations in word using word to vec, and the answer it would be like queen, probably queen. Um, so also it's relatively modern, 
it's good documentation, maybe not as good as Pacey, and it was uh, the first one providing word to VEC. And then we have GLOV, Global Vectors. Again, a more refined version of embeddings is modern. You have a good documentation that really allows you to understand how things work. And it provides you uh, the raw word to vectors. So you have uh, a, a huge file. Uh, in this file, you will see uh, a single word and the vectorized representation. So let's say you have cat and then you have uh, um, 50, uh, 50 space vectors uh, with, uh, with a mathematical representation. Also, you can have uh, a different, uh, a di di different vector sizes based on uh, uh, how, how accurate you want to be and how, um, how much time you want to spend because the, the bigger the vector, the more computation you have to do. And then you have the, the one you were all asking about, Hugging Face, which is amazing. There is a company behind Hugging Face, which uh, is now expanding extremely fast. I feel they had a similar uh, journey, similar probably to OpenAI. Uh, so they started out as a small team, small company, focusing on doing uh, great work and open source it as much as they can. And now they are transitioning to a, uh, a way to monetize this. So you, they provide some APIs, uh, they, uh, they are expanding like crazy at the moment. And why they are really interesting is because they are uh, providing a lot of uh, implementation of papers from Google, Facebook, Grammarly, uh, and, and other companies. Uh, and uh, it's extremely easy for, uh, uh, for practitioners to use it. So you can download the the library, you download the models, and you'll be able to, to use uh, BERT, Roberta, um, and all these complex models. You also have word vectors. You actually have a, a more advanced version of word vectors, uh, which is uh, like transformers or the, a lot of the deep learning approaches. So now let's see different ways of, of doing the, ta the, the important tasks of NLP with, uh, with these libraries. Uh, actually, before doing this, we can have our first break. It's already uh, 3.54. Uh, so let's go, let's come back at, uh, um, let's say uh, four and uh, I will also share this part with you, which is uh, uh, the, the, the code for text representation. Uh, I also take questions actually, let's, let's do this. I take questions first, uh, and then we have the break uh, and then we, uh, we continue. Uh, so uh, let's see, this is the, la the next notebooks we're gonna, we're gonna see. And uh, I see a question here could you elaborate? Uh, so Winchell is asking, could you elaborate for generating or correcting grammar or text? Is neural network representation sufficient or any constituency grammar checker is still needed? Great question. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say that it is mostly deep learning. Uh, so if you go to uh, Hugging Face, you'll be able to uh, to see some of these models, in particular models from Grammarly, which is a great add-on that I use. So this, uh, uh, this little add-on is from Grammarly. Uh, actually, they don't have models, but uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are basically using deep learning, so neural networks, uh, to correct the grammar. Uh, and I'm someone who actually use uh, the probabilistic uh, structures uh, 10 years ago. So it was actually, um, it was something that uh, the researcher would infer from the text. So uh, some grammatical rules either from the text or from the, from the language. So we would enforce to have, uh, for example, the name in a certain position, the adjective in another position and so on. 
and on top of this structure, fixed structure, you have uh, some probabilities, which is probably what, what you are referring here with uh, um, with uh, with uh, the with with your question. That's definitely the old approach. The new approach is uh, going through uh, a neural network, and the neural network will uh, uh, will uh, generate maybe the next. Uh, the next uh, the next word which is what you already have in, uh, uh, in 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 gmail or will correct the word based on the context which is uh, what grammarly does the in the our uh, now our late in the in the last part of this uh, of this course we will see uh, these some of these models not for grammar but um, models that require the whole uh, sentence or the word paragraph and then they will uh, given the context they will infer what the word should be uh, and so they can give grammatical suggestions uh, check the spelling check the, the tense and so on yes yeah, so resend the link again for the google drives uh, i will do that howard then we have um, Christian, is an LTK kind of obsolete? It's not better to use GenSim or other libraries nowadays. I would, I would say no, depends on the, on the task, of course. Uh, probably you can get away with most things with uh, using uh, more modern libraries, but NLTK has uh, a lot of uh, old and important things that in some uh, specific fields might be extremely useful. Uh, something I used before using word to vector and can be used in, con con in conjunction of this is the uh, NLTK similarity um, uh, function. So with NLTK, you can check the similarity between two words, cat and dog, but this similarity is not computed on the uh, rep this mathematical representation, but on actually, um, um, uh, let's say a taxonomy of words. So uh, looking at the dictionary, they created this, uh, uh, this taxonomy and they know that uh, a dog is a, a subset of animal. Uh, so they are able to create these, uh, these comparisons. So this is just an example of things can be use, useful for. I definitely use it much more for pre-processing. Uh, if I need something, uh, very specific otherwise yes uh, modern libraries are, are the best the best choice okay uh, i only share it with the paras the, the the link thank you for for flagging it we send it with every, to everyone and let's see everyone so I'm gonna, so this one is the Jupyter Notebooks. We are gonna see after, after the break. And uh, let's say this uh, five minutes break. So feel free to grab a glass of water, have a little break and we'll see, uh, we'll see you soon. In the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to write in the chat. Uh, I will be away from keyboard from uh, for for like a few minutes, but I will I will answer when I'm back. Welcome back, everyone. So I saw uh, a message from Chad, but important that uh, I didn't realize I was uh, when I was sharing my link. Um, I was also using my uh, second account, so it has a uh, uh, out user equal to two. So if you see in the chat, he sent uh, the link without this um, um, uh, without this out user. So I'll try to eliminate also for, from out, uh, from the other um, uh, from the other links. Um, and let's go back to our uh, to our presentation. I'm gonna put it full time, still sharing my screen, hopefully. 
And now uh, I'm just going to go through the main deep learning, sorry, uh, the main um, uh, natural language processing steps uh, with different libraries. We're going to also see in the notebook some uh, hands on examples so you can play a little bit around with them and uh, and see how you can uh, uh, you, you can you can use these libraries. But let's see the first um, the first important concept that we're going to see is a, a, a tokenizer. A tokenizer, as the name suggests, creates tokens. So given a sequence of characters, uh, the tokenizer is able to chop up uh, in, uh, into meaningful tokens. So the easiest things you can think about is a sentence. So if you have on your computer uh, just a series of, char of, 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 of um um, characters, so uh, T, H, I, S, space. For for the machine, a space can be something that not necessarily delimit a word. Sometimes it's a column, semicolon, dash. So actually, this task is not that easy. Uh, it's easy in very in a very clean text, but if you look at uh, Twitter, sometimes you don't have spaces uh, or. Uh, uh, you have abbreviations, you have uh, words that come together I and mean, they should be separated. So you will find uh, uh, different levels of different tokenizers. You find uh, uh, rule-based tokenizers that you can provide. You can just split it on the space or uh, any punctuation, uh, dot, uh, exclamation point, question mark. Uh, or you can find uh, neural uh, the tokenizers. So tokenizers that uh, use neural networks to, to make this uh, separation. Uh, we will see the NLTK, uh, the NLTK uh, tokenizer. If you want to go to do an, an easy one, you can just do download the uh, punctuation and then you, uh, you create your text token by simply uh, applying the uh, word tokenizer to sample text. Uh, so we'll see the code uh, in, in the notebook, but word tokenizer is uh, part of NLTK. So it should be NLTK dot word tokenizer here. Stemming is also another important task. Uh, and uh, it's important because it reduces the sparsity of your input. Uh, so already uh, stemming, uh, do we really need this uh, ING at the end? Uh, this is what uh, stemming does. It's just cutting words into his root, into their root, and uh, uh, it's it's a common way to reduce dimensionality without losing much of the uh, of the information. So you have M R E's. Everything will become B. Car, cars, cars, and so on all will become cars. Then a more modern problem: uh, emoticons. Uh, so how do you treat uh, uh, emojis? Uh, well, emojis cannot be treated as punctuation, so you can just simply remove the emojis because sometimes they convey the, the sentiment. If your task is a sentiment analysis, you definitely want to keep uh, um, emoticons. Uh, and the way it is usually done is translating this into words. Uh, a nice library is uh, it's part of the spacey universe. Uh, so it's just a, uh, some library, extra libraries you can download from spacey. And you can use to convert, uh, uh, to, to convert emojis into text. Again, we'll see soon an example. Then we have stop words. Stop words are words that are not useful, maybe because they are too common or too specific, are everything you want to remove. Uh, they don't add any signal and everything that does, doesn't add signal uh, is better to remove it, especially in NLP. And this again will uh, reduce the amount of uh, sparsity that you have in your data set uh, and also reduce the, uh, increase the signal because uh, uh, at the end, these stop words might just become noise. You usually do that after tokenization. So you have the pizzas on the table uh, and in this case, uh, uh, you probably don't need the is on the 
that much. If you say pizza table, you're likely to get the gist. And uh, disclaimer, I'm an Italian, so I'm gonna have quite a few pizzas in my presentations. Uh, you have other, also other methods. So you have a, a simple list of stop words. Uh, you can just check, you can just remove any uh, stop words that is in your list. Uh, pretty easy things to do, but you can also look at the frequency. The idea is that uh, words that are too frequent or not frequent enough don't add any signal. So uh, this is something you want to, to remove. Again, list can be extremely simple, just a text file with all the words you want to remove. And the frequency one is just calculated by looking at uh, how often a token or a word appears in the text. So you have uh, uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. In this way, you already see that uh, in one sentence you have two the. So you already understand that uh, when you have a, 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 a big data set, uh, this will be able to identify stop words pretty, pretty easily. How do we count these words? Uh, Scikit-learn provides very easy, very easy APIs to do so. Uh, so if you download Scikit-learn, you can use a, a count vectorizer or hashing vectorizer. Count vectorizer is just uh, counting the occurrences of the words and creating a, a, a list of, um, uh, sorry, a, a vectorized representation based on this count. Hashing vectorizer is the kind of the equivalent, but it's much faster because uh, count vectorizer needs to look up the word uh, to replace it with the, uh, with the number. Hashing uh, does the trick uh, using a hashing function. So it does not have to look around, it's just uh, much faster. It requires more, uh, a bit more memory, but uh, if you care about uh, performances, uh, hashing vectorizer is quite nice. The bit, the more advanced version is a TF-IDF, uh, which means terms frequency, inverse document frequency. And it's another way to count things, but a bit smarter. Instead of just looking at how frequent a word is in your corpus, you look at that plus uh, how frequent is in your sentence. And the idea is that if it's very frequent in your sentence, uh, it's very important to represent your sentence so that uh, for that sentence, that word should have a higher value. Uh, but if uh, it's also common in all other sentences, then maybe it's not that important. For example, the, the would be common everywhere. But if on the other end is only uh, uh, very common in your in a few sentences, that means that that word is very important in that context. So you should have a, a higher weight to assign to that vector. Also, sometimes you need to remove stop words. Sometimes you shouldn't remove words. You can do, uh, if you do text classification, definitely remove words, path filtering. You probably just need a few uh, language classification you really, I think uh, with the 50 tokens, you, you are uh, guaranteed to detect the, 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 the words, sorry, the language that uh, you, um, you are trying to, uh, to, pre to, to predict. General classification as well, uh, and so on. Sometimes you need to keep them. So never apply blind, blindly uh, a set of, uh, of rules to your task. Always think uh, what is important, uh, machine translation, of course, if you take out stop words, uh, you will not be able to uh, translate uh, something from English to French. Uh, language modeling as well, text summarization, question answering problems, all these things, for all these things, you need the entirety of, uh, uh, of, your, um, of your sentence. And uh, Something else I want to point out, if you're not familiar with the scikit-learn APIs, is that they already provide you quite a few things out of the box. So if you use count vectorizer or TF-IDF, you can also 
specify the stop words. So you just provide as an argument stop words equal to English. Uh, Scikit-learn already has the English stop words. Uh, you can also provide a tokenizer if you just don't want to split it with uh, with spaces, something more complicated. You create your function, you provide the tokenizer. The t the frequency is already something you can do out of the box, so you can filter just by uh, using the, um, the the argument of the function. So it is very handy, it's very clean. Uh, you create pipelines uh, that makes the process very smooth. So I would say this is what me, we are missing uh, on more complex models like BERT or uh, tra transformer hugging face model. In general, the code is more messy. It's a bit more difficult to organize. You have my, many more uh, custom steps, but we, we're going to see this uh, in the last part of the of the course. Again. Another important part is part of speech identification, very commonly abbreviated with POS. So what is the problem? We have help. Help can be a name or a noun. It all depends on the context. So part of speech tagging is a, a process of uh, tagging the function of a word in a certain context of words. For example, I eat pizza. If you use a post tagger, you, your output will be I, uh, proper pronoun, eat, verb, pizza, noun. So we have personal pronoun, VB verb, and uh, noun. So this, these are uh, common, uh, like you will find, uh, um, let's say a, a common uh, set of, uh, uh, of way to represent the personal pronouns and so on. So usually if you find a table, that's what uh, uh, all the post taggers use. Uh, the post tag tagging is important in machine translation because you need to know uh, what was the the, the function of the noun uh, in a different language. Sometimes uh, uh, noun can be translated in different ways depending on the, on the context and how they were used. Language modeling, text summarization, and so on. Now we go to the interesting part, let's say, in encoding things. We will see two, two main ways of, uh, two main uh, encoders. Let's say the mechanical one and the smart ones. The mechanical encoders is just a, 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 um, an automatic way to represent the data in a different format. And this is what we are talking now. So if we have uh, uh, the, the uh, numbers in words, for example, we have one, two, three, and they are brought down as a number, of course, I can represent them with the, with the appropriate number. But what about if I have words like Paris, London, New York, how do I represent them? Uh, what you don't want to, in, to do is to introduce some properties that the word does not have. Uh, so we don't know, it doesn't make sense to say that Paris is greater than London, but it makes sense to say that one is greater than two. How do we do that? Well, a common way to do so is uh, using a one-off encoder. And uh, uh, in this case, you, you, if, let's say you think about all the, uh, all the cities in the world, uh, you can represent the cities with uh, a set of zeros or one. So from a column where you have uh, cities, let's say you have the, 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 the variable city, and uh, the values are Paris, London, New York, you translate that column into this huge column where you have one if the city is present. So if you have this city in, uh, in the first line and zero if you don't. So in this case, it's called one hot encoder because only one value would be different from zero. And uh, What's the advantage of this? 
uh, one that you can use it in uh, in algorithm that uh, wouldn't work with uh, just uh, text or representation. If you have a um, decision tree, you can use Paris, uh, London. Uh, but if you have a logistic regression or another uh, another task, how that need that requires a, a number, how do you do it? Well, you can use one hot encoder. And uh, the, the interesting part is that uh, it will not be represented like this in memory, but you're, you will only need to specify which numbers are different than zero. So you will specify uh, call, uh, row zero, column zero, and then nothing else for the first line. And then for the second one, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it will be the eighth. As we start from zero, we'll see that this is the uh, column seven and row one. So you have uh, uh, one zero to represent this whole line. And as you can see, it's much cheaper to do that than writing down all the zeros. Then we have classifiers. So once we did all the cleaning, all the representation work, we need to use some classifiers. And I can use Nave Base, Super Vector Machine, Random Forest, really many, many uh, classifiers because now you have numbers, so you can work mathematically with, uh, with, with, with them with any algorithm. A common one is uh, Nave Base classifier, just given the previous word, what's the likelihood of seeing the next one? but also support vector machine and uh, many others are, are used. And uh, this is where I'm gonna check the chat. Uh, so we have the Christian that is asking, would you recommend to use together Spacey and LTK in pre-processing? Definitely, yes. Uh, even uh, tokenizers from BERT are, I usually mix and match as it, it feels more appropriate for the task. For I try to use the least amount of libraries, uh, but if I need to expand, I have no problem expanding to different libraries, even if they are supposed to do similar tasks. Yes, you can download. Um, uh, so I have a few direct messages that you might not be able to see. One is, uh, can we download the Google Slides Python notebooks? Yes, so for the slides, you just do uh, file, download, and choose how you download them. For the Jupyter Notebooks, same thing. Uh, so it's a uh, save and copy in Drive if you want to run it on, uh, on Google Colab. Otherwise, you can download it as uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and you can run it as a normal Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, then we have a crash. Would you call these uh, co-occurrence metrics? Uh, not exactly. So I'm probably referring to one out encoding. Um, one out encoding in general is supposed to have only one value that is uh, different from zero. While the co-occurrence metrics is something that uh, uh, you check, for example, inside a word. Uh, which words occur at, at the same time. So the co-occurrence matrix is more to extract information. This one not encoder is to change the way we represent things. Uh, okay, the, the other direct message, could you please share the links again? I joined in the middle of the meeting, absolutely no problem. So you should be able to find uh, all everything in a slide zero, so at the end of, uh, of slide zero here. So once you have that, you have everything. So then if you go to the sli last slide, you will see two links. And those links should, should take you, uh, sorry, no. What happened here? So I'll we'll just uh, update this. In here, you find uh, all the notebooks. And uh, in the second one, you find all the slides. 
and uh, in the chat, I will just send uh, the slides we are at to avoid confusions. So now this is where we are. Uh, we are at notebook one. Yes, our is asking, can you send the link to everyone in the chat? Uh, sure. So we have notebook one. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna also send these other two. I didn't want to make uh, to send too many links, but this is slides, slides here, and uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks are here. Ah, oh, sorry, I send it again to a specific person instead of everyone, and um, take out user two, and then Jupyter notebooks. Use it too there. Okay, let's see if this works. And so now everyone should have everything. No problem at all. Um, now where I was at? Yes. Um, text representation. So now I want to do some exercises. Uh, oh, sorry, maybe there was another question. Let me check. Uh, oh, yes. So there's another question from Ryan. What was the other encoder called? Not the one hot. Uh, it's actually called encoder. It's a nor generic way to, uh, to group a set of algorithms that uh, takes uh, uh, one representation, for example, the semantic representation with words, uh, and transform into a different representation, for example, um, uh, vectors of numbers. So I call them smart encoders because uh, this uh, is done through uh, an, uh, an algorithm, while a one out encoder is literally a mechanical thing. So it's just transforming, uh, it's pivoting one column basically. So transforming one column in a, in a big matrix. We will see the smart encoders later on uh, because the smart encoders add the uh, informations and uh, do quite a bit of things. Uh, but at the moment, I just wanted to mention this uh, in, also important. Uh, um, and uh, yes, so now I have two more messages. Yes. Uh, Chike, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, otherwise, I apologize. In what context do you use deep learning frameworks as opposed to uh, count vectorizer and traditional machine learning models? Great question. Uh, in general, I'll, I always want to have a baseline uh, just to understand uh, the improvement of the model, how much we can gain with more complex uh, deep learning model. So I always start with uh, uh, a simple uh, traditional model. It's also very easy to productionize. So if you don't have the infrastructure, uh, if you want something uh, uh, easier and faster, you can just go the traditional route. And uh, a lot of the times you have a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent results, especially if you do uh, classification tasks. You have the step in the in the middle, which is probably where you get the most uh, uh, the, the best uh, the best deal in terms of uh, uh, faster to create uh, and uh, easier and more clean to to produce, which is using a, a let's say a deep learning method to extract the features and literally zero work because you can take uh, word to vec glove. Uh, uh, you can take a uh, bird as they are, just as a way to translate to translate a word into a vector. So that's the in, the good part of uh, of deep learning is basically that you can create uh, instead of doing a TF-IDF or, or, some, or something manual, you can do it with um, uh, with in in this uh, in this way. Then uh, I usually. I usually go with the, some flavor of bird, 
so it can be excellent Bert, Roberta, depends a bit on the task, uh, uh, or basically any other deep learning approach. Uh, but usually I do it in this order. And uh, recently I was working with some, uh, some legal uh, documents and I just use a TF, IDF and a classifier. Actually the classification was quite big and it was, uh, it, 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 it produced pretty decent results already. So sometimes you'd feel uh, this is a good first iteration. I don't need to be worried about, uh, you know, the infrastructure, the additional cost. Uh, and uh, that is good enough. So I think I answered all questions. No problem. Um, and um, now I'll just do some, some practical work with all the libraries. So we will, we will use uh, everything we mentioned, including uh, hugging face. I think there is, a, there is some, uh, some task that we are gonna use hugging face. Uh, and it's gonna be uh, not just me talking, but also you typing, which is more uh, more interesting. So we start with an LTK. So introduction to Python. I wrote down some information about each library. Let's see if you if you run this uh, important LTK and LTK download, you have. Uh, uh, a little nice interface that asks you what you want to do. You want to download a specific uh, file, just list everything you can download, update something, configuration, help or quit. Uh, so now I just want the list. If you do it in a normal Jupyter notebook or in a, in a script, it actually, uh, there is a nice uh, user interface that pop up, pops up much better than this. But now we're just gonna use this. So I'll put the L and you get the list we had before. So this is why an LTK is nice because it's easy to download a corpus, for example, the brown corpus, uh, some other specific corpus. You can have a perceptron, you can have a, the Australian Broadcasting Commission 2006. So you have a lot of things that are, are very easy to, uh, to use. Uh, and if you want to, okay, to list more, you put, uh, uh, yeah, you, 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 you put another enter and you will list a bit, a bit more things. Just gonna go back to where it was at the beginning. Um, uh, so you, you have a lot of things that you can do with an LTK and this is the, the cool part of it. Uh, with Spacey, uh, we'll need to install Spacey. So if you don't know, uh, you can execute any command line command uh, with uh, exclamation point and then the, the, the command you will put in the terminal. So in this case, I inst installed Spacey and I also download the uh, uh, Eng English core web. So if you run these two cells, you have this into your Colab notebooks or in your Jupyter notebooks if you're running, if you're running it on your local machine. It might take a little bit, but uh, yeah, you have uh, Spacey installed. So while we are waiting, I'm just gonna go ahead. In Spacey, you can download models in a slightly different way compared to an LTK. Uh, so you can uh, you can just uh, say load and the, the model you want to learn to load. Similar way, you can also download um, download things, either models or corpus and, and other and other stuff. And uh, if you ask why. If you ask why do you need to, okay, I try to terminate this, but it doesn't. Okay. So now it's running the pip install. I 
as you can see, a lot of the requirements are already satisfied, but that, now we can load the model. So download and was downloaded and successfully installed. Uh, what goes on when you hit enter for NLTK? Um, so this is basically just a, a way to navigate through a list of packages, uh, models, corpus, uh, uh, punctuation, uh, files, stop words. Uh, uh, so basically to navigate, you can just uh, uh, run download. After you run download, you can uh, you have three options. Uh, let's, if you pray list, if you put list, you will see a list of things that uh, uh, you 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 are able, you you can download. And if you want to see more things, you need to press enter when prompt. So it's just a way to to basically check the next page. When you once you have something that you want to download, you can just put the the name of the things you want to download. Uh, so in the in the windows you had before, you can just put uh, D as download and then the name of the, uh, the name of the, uh, let's, this one should be a bit faster. I'm gonna show you. The name of the things you want to download. Okay, you got it. Um, what is your favorite NLP preprocessing package? Or which one do you use more frequently? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, Scikit Learn uh, for baselines definitely just is so easy. It's so clean. This is what I really miss uh, on different uh, different uh, uh, packages. For when I need to be, uh, let's say, a bit more serious, or be hugging fades, sometimes uh, customized models. Uh, but let's say best packages is uh, Scikit Learn that already provides some uh, pre processing part in a very easy way, NLTK uh, and Hugging Face. I would say these two. I'm, uh, I am a bit of a dinosaur because uh, Spacey is probably easier and more user friendly for a lot of tasks. It's just that I was used to NLTK. So, probably if I have to suggest something, I uh, to swap uh, NLTK with spacing. So there was a question from uh, Daniela. Um, perfect. No more questions. I'll just interrupt this. And uh, so we have uh, Spacey, in Spacey, we can load the uh, things in this way. And uh, very easy, easy to use, probably more clean documentation. So as I said, uh, you probably swap, you can swap an LTK for Spacey in, in, in most cases. Sometimes uh, if you don't find something in, a, in Spacey, then check an LTK. Another great one is uh, GenSim. It's again a bit of a dinosaur of a library because you can use a uh, uh, spacey contains a uh, word to vec. So basically, why would you use word, word to vec when you have a better package for everything? But I wanted to put in this list because uh, it's the original one. Part of the algorithms are uh, implemented in a slightly different way, so they are more similar to the to the the original paper spacey is more oriented towards optimization. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it's more or less. Uh, but again, it's, you need to know about GenSim because it was the, the first one uh, and it's still used for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of applications. So let's see, why is it, is it useful? Probably we need to run uh, uh, this pip install. So you can just pip install Gen sim and now we run the code. So in this case, we have a, a toy sample. We have one document and we have a corpus that I created. So we have the human machine interface for the lab ABC computer application. 
it's part of the corpus uh, and then we have some other uh, uh, some other sentences and you can probably see interface a few times computer another few times so now how do you um, how do you translate all these sentences into um, numbers using uh, GenSim. It's very easy. First of all, uh, we need to lowercase each document and split in spaces. So here we do a simple, uh, simple preprocessing uh, and simple tokenization. Uh, and then uh, um, we do that for everything in our corpus. So we create uh, our, translate our corpus into tokens. Then what we can do is uh, simply uh, create a dictionary with all our uh, tokenized corpus. So the dictionary will be used as a way to uh, translate each word into a, a set of, uh, of documents of, uh, sorry, of vectors. So now that you created the dictionary, you have that uh, uh, human is a vector of, uh, let's say, 20 numbers, 20, 34, 91, uh, 11, and so on. Uh, and now what you need to do is just simply uh, find your, take your document. You do the same pre-processing. You can create a function, of course, it will be a bit cleaner, but in this case, it's quite easy to just lower and split. And then you, this will already give you the uh, vectorized representation. So this is the vectorized representation, and you see that uh, uh, human is 0, 1, then 1, 1, and, and, and so on. So in this case, because we have the first sentence, everything will be in 1. But if we do in this way, you can see that uh, if you take out the first sentence, you will try to find which of these uh, words are inside our dictionary. So you probably have a uh, computer in the first one. Uh, so 1-1, one, one, we have 10-1 and 15-1. So it's just how this is represented. We don't find all words. So in this case, those words are simply ignored. For glove, is basically the same thing. Uh, we have a question from, from Chad. Uh, the way we have uh, corpus in LTK, brown corpus, Wikipedia, etc. What if we have our own text and want to make our own corpus? How do we make that? It can be as simple as this. In this case, uh, uh, you can read a file, of course, if you have your corpus in your file, uh, and then you pass this corpus in the pre-processing. And if you're using a, a word to vec then you, uh, you create a dictionary. So you have GenSim Corpora. Corpora, you can see this package is going to implementation of audio. Um, yeah, you have a small description of what it does, but it basically is the, the, the translation between uh, words and uh, a vector representation. In this case, you are using it. Uh, uh, sure, I'm going to send the notebook. There it is. Um, so you have, uh, let's say, a, corp, uh, a file with all your text, uh, or you read these files and you create a big uh, pandas data frame or just a, a big uh, a big list. Uh, if you want to use word to vec then you either uh, use only the vectors or you train, um, um, uh, you, you train an algorithm to extract the, the vectors. Unless you have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data, it's probably best to start with uh, a pretty existing embedding. And uh, uh, so using a uh, word to vec like in this case. Otherwise, we will see in the, in the last uh, tutorial, 
how you can do you can retrain the the model itself but what happens is basically uh, in this case you have a, a word like this and then a set of numbers uh, and the you are basically just doing a lookup uh, uh, apologies uh, I will send again the the notebook without the without the out to so as someone already mentioned we have uh, to take out this out user part because I have multiple users so this should be fine let's see yes so it works for me now it should work for you as well Um, and uh, so now we have uh, no problem. So now, uh, once you have your 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 corpus, you trans you create a dictionary, basically a lookup table between the pre-existing vectors and words, and then you can use the dictionary doc to vec to do the translation so you translate your document in the, the list of words because i do the split uh, into the equivalent uh, uh, vectorized representation so this is the first word the second word and the third word very similar with glove which actually is more uh, uh, it's more explicit somehow. So if you do, let's see, you can, you don't actually need any library here. If you uh, search for this, you will see that is a simple uh, file that you can download. Um, So you can download a file that is exactly as I said before, it's just a word and a set of, uh, of numbers. If you click here, you will see that you will have a, uh, with me. Mm. Um, where is it? Well, it basically, it, it's just a simple, um, a simple uh, set of words. I think I can do it from here. I can show you from here because I allow people to download it from my from my repository. If you just wait one second. It should be in the in this. Mm. Oh, no, not in this one. In the online course, club notebooks, NLP lessons. No, but yeah, basically, you, it's just a file. Just wanted to show you the file, but it's a simple file, as I said. Um, and the way you can use it, if you download the file, uh, you can uh, you can either pick the a vector of uh, fifty char characters, uh, two hundred. Uh, so there are a few uh, that you can pick the dimension basically. Uh, and yeah, this is how it looks like. You have a word, and then you have a vector of numbers that uh, represent this word. So basically, what you want to do is just a lookup, look at the word, and uh, get the vector. And this is exactly what you are doing. You are 
uh, opening the file uh, in a reading mode. You lead, you uh, uh, load the lines, you split them, you get the value. Uh, you force it to be as a float 32 array, just out of, uh, um, out to optimize a little bit the code. Because I know that this is a float 32. Uh, and then you can create a, a vector of the embedding and you can see it's just a dictionary. So you have the word and the vector. Um, and then we have the final library, which is Hugging Face. And this is maybe the most interesting one because it, this is where you can find the, most of the latest algorithms. You can just install with the pip install transformers. Uh, and uh, in this case, I just want to use the tokenizer. So BERT tokenizer is one of those uh, uh, NLP packages that, uh, sorry, NLP, the deep learning uh, algorithms that are trying to solve the tokenizer problem. So dividing the, the sentence in, uh, in different chunks. I want to use a certain pre-trained algorithm, which is the uh, BERT base uncased, which means that is uh, the BERT algorithm, uh, which is a way to get bidirectional embeddings. The base, because there are a lot of variations of BERTs, and uncased because uh, it's all lower cased. So if you see, uh, this should be, Yes, it was fine. And uh, now when I run the tokenizer, I load the tokenizer from pre-trained base case, so I don't need to do anything. And uh, he likes pizza. I expect to be tokenized in the correct way, but also to be uh, to lowercase my he. As you can see, it might take a little, a little while because he's using a, a model and not just um, a, a, a simple uh, set of rules. So he downloaded the model and then he created the, the tokens. As you can see, he decided to, to, to uh, uh, not remove the dot. And this is a valid, uh, uh, a valid result because uh, if you want punctuation to be removed, you should explicitly remove it uh, in, uh, in another phase. Uh, it's not silently removed. So don't expect to be, you, you know, in general, there are the, these are the steps you need to, to go through, um, but don't expect the libraries to necessarily go, go all through, through all steps. Finally, we have uh, stop words, stemming, uh, one not encoding and more. So this is also um, part of uh, removing stop words, creating different uh, and uh, more compact representation. And uh, as you said before, there are basically two different ways of uh, uh, main ways of uh, defining stop words is either with a list of words or with the frequency of, of the word. With the frequency is, um, is pretty easy, especially in scikit-learn. Uh, so in this case, just to, to show you how easy it is, I uh, created the data set. I got the 20 news group from scikit-learn, divided in train and test set. Uh, and then uh, I got the, the keys and uh, just to show some simple text. Um, after I want to use, let's say, count of vectorizer. So it just count, it create a vector with the count of, of each single word. I specify that I want to analyze it by word. Uh, and I want not just to have uh, one single word, but to have two words at the time. So 
I I get the uh, my vectorizer. I do a fit and a transform. So what it means is that it uh, it creates the vectors uh, from the data I I provide, but then it also transform the data into vectors. Uh, and then I print the feature names and the length of uh, of all our vectors. So I will just want to to print the last. Uh, three um, cup and, and as you can see sorry as you can see you have uh, just two words at the time every every token is compromised by two two words and we, we have uh, 200 thousand 250 thousand of these so why is it useful is because uh, you are creating this uh, part here, you just get the features name, but uh, you can also uh, you can also have the text or representation. So in uh, in X two, now you have uh, uh, you have just numbers. I need to run this. And TK, I think we already run this. I just took it out. But I'm gonna use uh, also the tokenizer from uh, from an LTK. And in this case, uh, so uh, this uh, finished. So you see, in next two now I have an array. So the third uh, vector is just a, a big array, and not a word anymore. Now with the tokenizer, uh, they said sometimes we want to be fancy and we just use the deep learning approach to use the tokenizer like in Hugging Face. Sometimes we want to have more control. Uh, we have a question, sorry, from Paras. From sentiment analysis or topic extraction, um, will you remove stop words? You can remove stop words, but you need to be very careful not to remove uh, uh, key keywords. Uh, for example, not, it might be considered a stop word in a, some, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, maybe in text classification, like in anti-spam, you don't care if there is a not or not. Uh, but definitely for sentiment analysis uh, is something you need to do. So the approach I would take in this case is to uh, uh, probably uh, initially keep the stop words and see how it performs and then try to uh, remove a, a sanitized version of the stop words. So not just go for a blind approach based on frequency because you might remove terms like happiness or sadness or not or a smiley face and, and, and these things. And I, I like this question because it illustrates uh, how many uh, how manual things are still are. Uh, on a more uh, uh, automated uh, version, like if you want to have, if you want to use a deep learning model for that, uh, you don't need to, to remove stop words. And maybe in this case is a, is a bit easier. Another, another point for deep learning models in uh, uh, sentiment analysis is that uh, traditional models always struggle with negations. So they said before not uh, can be just before the word you want to negate, but I also can have other words in the middle uh, or it can be a double negation. Uh, and these things are more difficult to, to understand. Uh, so definitely the, let's say the deep learning approach in this case resolves a lot of problems. And here again, just to, to see why I still use a, NLTK because it can just download stop words or Russian stop words or uh, things that are not that common in uh, many packages. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can just use it out of the box. So just a simple showing uh, what you will remove with no, no, I fly. Interesting enough, you see you remove this no 
but you don't remove the capitalized one. Uh, and this again makes total sense because if you want to sanitize uh, the text, you need to do it before. Otherwise, this is a simple process. Uh, so it's a little bit stupid. It doesn't, it shouldn't care about uh, uh, is this a, a no or a noun and so on. So if you want to, to remove, then you need to, to lower it yourself. If you want to see the list of the st of, of stop words, you can just uh, get all the, the stop words list from an LTK or from scikit-learn and just print it out and you will see that, uh, yes, either, uh, if you remove these, uh, these words, you will find uh, uh, some of them that needs to be sanitized. So maybe you add a, a process upstream to uh, add this to your tokenizer, for example, or also the add to your tokenizer because this might be a useful things to have. Uh, but definitely you don't want to have that so, mu so much punctuation in, uh, in your text. And uh, again, ZenSim, uh, uh, another thing you can use ZenSim for is to strip punctuation. You have the custom filters. So you create a custom filter in ZenSim, you process the string uh, and uh, yeah, you can, uh, um, you can like do, do it like this lambda, lambda function. So in this case, you, you took out all the unwanted, uh, unwanted characters that you had before. I'm gonna just run a little bit longer and uh, could you, dis uh, the question from Zhou, uh, could you discuss the usefulness of BERT and GPT-3 in practical NLP text analytics? Definitely. This is the, the last part of our uh, um, of our um, uh, of our tutorial. Spoiler alert: extremely useful. Like BERT is is the one that is the, the type of architecture that is beating uh, many state of the art algorithms. And uh, now the same or similar approaches are also used in other domains. For example, computer visions. And uh, again, they they are extremely extremely promising. Uh, BERT and GPT-3, at the end of the day, they, uh, they use similar uh, concepts. Um, the, the, main, the most important concept is the concept of trans decoder and encoder. Uh, but I, I will leave that to, to later because uh, I think one, introducing one, one piece at a time makes, makes sense in this case. Uh, again, this is an example of count, count, of, count vectorizer because I want to show you what happens when uh, when you when you want to translate words in uh, in uh, uh, vectors. And count vectorizer is just simply this: is taking uh, each uh, each single uh, in this case uh, uh, newsletter. So you have one document here. Uh, and it represents this document with a uh, with the vector. It counts how many occurrence uh, of each token you have in that vector, and this is the representation that you have. As you can see, it's mostly zero, so you want this to be represented as a sparse vector, uh, so only representing the elements that are not uh, uh, are are different from zero. Uh, and this is similar to one hot encoding, but one hot encoding has only one number that, sorry, one column that is different than zero. Uh, while uh, the other vectorizer, count vectorizer, TFIDF, hash vectorizer, they all have, uh, they all might have more than, uh, than one different from zero. Um, stemming, how do you, how do you stem things? Uh, you can use an LTK. For example, plays or played. Feel free to play a little bit with this code. Uh, you will see that it's always play. Uh, there are a lot of different stammer, uh, Porter stammer, Snowball stammer. They're just slightly different. Uh, uh, they're 
basically train in slightly different ways uh, with, with different text. So Snowball Stem, I think it also has the, the Russian language. Let's see if we have the help. Uh, the following languages are supported, Arabic, Danish, Dutch, English, Finnish, French, German, Russian, yeah, also Russian. I use the Russian one, that's why I remember. Portuguese, Romanian, you see, it's very, very flexible. And this is why you sometimes it's useful to have a, an old uh, library like uh, NLTK. It's because of completeness. You have a lot of people that already use it, expanding it uh, and uh, per, uh, improving it. So you have a good, um, a good final result. And then just to check how the stem the words uh, appear, I just do the process string, I stem them and you can see from basically this is a, a list of process words. If you notice, I'm using the same thing and doing one little step at a time. So we know what happens step by step and you can track the progress. Uh, of your um, of your algorithm, uh, this is the the type of steps that uh, you should also do in your uh, uh, in, in your uh, NLP task. The slightly different way to do the same. You see, there is a, and again a port stammer also in ZenSim. Let's see. Uh, doesn't list all the all the uh, languages, but if I remember correctly, it does not have all the languages. I don't remember exactly. Maybe it has, but sorry, but in, in any case, uh, in, this is slightly more useful uh, because uh, you can stem sentence while with uh, um, NLTK, you need to stem word by word. And if you think about the computer science part, of uh, NLP, uh, you can optimize this in different ways. For example, if, if it's word by word, you probably want to use a generator uh, and might be even more efficient than, uh, than uh, stemming the full sentence. But if you just want to be a bit practical and easier to understand for, for other people that are looking at your code, then probably this is so much more explicit and clear. Um, and then uh, the final part is this is really where we put everything together. So now I would uh, just explain this a little bit. Actually, maybe it's, uh, it's a bit too long. Uh, let's have a break now. Uh, and then we see basically what happens putting everything together, all the, all the concepts we saw, improving this, how do we improve the token, our tokenizers in a efficient way. Uh, and this is something you will need to do also with BERT and with other models. So all these, uh, all these concepts are indispensable in any case. Some more on uh, spell checking, uh, uh, emojis, uh, part of speech tagging. And at the end, I will ask you to, to do an exercise. If you, if you, if you feel, uh, let's say, adventurous and you already want to, to try it out, feel free to start it because you already have all the main, uh, all the main information to, to do this exercise. If not, I will just suggest to uh, go through the code uh, modify a little bit, write it on your own, see what happens if uh, you change uh, something. Uh, what I'm suggesting is basically to uh, internalize some of this concept by uh, working a little bit by yourself on this. But if you're already familiar with this, feel free to jump to the exercise. And then I will, we'll have a break of, let's say, 10 minutes. After these 10 minutes, uh, we're gonna go through the the rest. So, enhancing scikit learn how to uh, create reusable and efficient code uh, to have more uh, uh, to solve more complex tasks in NLP. 
uh, and then uh, more about the emojis and uh, spell checks and all these things. Again, let's say 10 minutes. So we're gonna back. We're gonna be back at 5:25. Any questions? Anything? Feel free to message uh, in the chat. Uh, I'll be uh, away from keyboard for uh, let's say five minutes, uh, but then I will surely read all your questions. So uh, speak to you soon. Uh, 5.25, uh, I'll start explaining again. And uh, as again, uh, as I said at the beginning, initially this was a uh, um, uh, eight hours course, yes. So I might skip some of the topics, uh, just gonna gain, get the main one given what, what you were interested in. So uh, I felt there were two main, uh, uh, group of people, people were more interested on the the basics uh, of, of, of a natural language processing and then uh, the more advanced stuff. So I'll probably skip like uh, recurrent neural networks uh, and uh, maybe topic extraction, I will leave it till the end. Okay, I see someone wanted to, to have more advanced. Uh, I will talk, try just uh, because we, we, we put out a um of course uh, if nobody said uh, that they were interested in the in the basic topic i would definitely skip them but as some people were and uh, this is what we this is what we said we would do i will also just finish the basic topics there are not that many uh left uh, um but yeah i probably skip uh, recurrent neural networks i will leave topic extraction at the end if we have time uh and then we'll still go through uh, transfer learnings and transformers, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, a good compromise for what everyone was uh, wanted to, uh, to to see. There's nothing here specific for uh, sentiment analysis, uh, but a lot of the concepts are, are the same. Uh, so you can use the basics or the more advanced for, for sentiment analysis. And, um, yeah, so I'll just finish this, uh, and then uh, we go through 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 the other presentation and uh, Jupyter notebooks. So more the problems, there's mostly a suggestion. Like a lot of people asking, what should I do with emojis, with uh, uh, emoticons, uh, with uh, you, you, we have a, a plethora of uh, of new things with GIF and all these animation. For, for GIF, I don't have a a clear answer yet, other than looking at the, at the as much metadata as you have. Sometimes you are able to to get the, the name of the file. Uh, but for emojis, luckily there is a there is a library that does it for you. Um, we start the runtime. So uh, after you inst you install the uh, space emoji, which is part part of the space spacey ecosystem, uh, you need to rest, restart the, the runtime. Let's say restart the runtime, yes. And then uh, uh, run before, so that will run all the, all the libraries before. Fortunately, also this one, sorry, all the cells before. Yeah, okay, I'll just, hopefully, we will not need many, I might need these. So let's just run these. Okay, and uh, what just, uh, uh, just to show you what you can do is basically, you are able to directly translate that uh, uh, emojis into into words. So if this is the Unicode of the emoji, then you can have uh, the the a sentence describing the emojis. Your thumbs up, dark skin tone, for example. So in this way, it's easy to uh, to to use this uh, together with your text uh, to get more more informations. 
uh, can find model and it might be related or something I, I had to restart the 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 notebook so it might be because uh, of that or maybe Let's see if this works yeah. but anyway it was just to demonstrate that you can do quite a few things with that um, we have part of speech tagging again part of speech tagging is creating some tags that provide extra information to our alg to uh, our algorithm on uh, how to process a certain word for example help is it used as a verb or as a noun in this case part of speech uh, algorithms are creating these uh, tags either with uh, some grammatic rules or some uh, deep learning approaches uh, so there can be either lexical based rule based and probabilistic method or deep learning method these are the main uh, pos uh, tagging algorithms uh, and you can use either of those uh, it will start with uh, nltk1 for a simple baseline and then try try someone from uh, from hugging face for example and also nltk provide a perceptron tagger uh, so just a few examples I'll skip through this because uh, at the end, you already know the concept. How to lemmatize things. Uh, you can use the lemmatizer uh, in a spacey, uh, pretty easy. You can also create your own rules. This is how you do it. So you can create a, a lookup dictionary. Uh, then you can add each single rules in the table as you want. Uh, and in this case, the rules can be if you find a noun, and you find an S, then uh, transform it to, uh, to cut it basically, keep out the S. You can also trans transform into an, an I, into whatever you want. So you see the big advantage is that uh, it's very customizable, which is also the, the, bad, the, the bad part because it means you need to understand how to do it, spend time on checking if the results are good or not. Why should you use this instead of something more automatic? Again, depends on your, the problem you're trying to solve. If you're having problems in uh, lemmatizing words, and this is probably something you find after one or two iterations, so you already have some results that work well enough, and you want to push your model to the next level, then you start experimenting with, uh, with different uh, lemmatization rules. Uh, so in this case, you see lemmatizer books, uh, we tell them there is a noun, so we take out the, the S at the end, so we only have book. Cat category encoder is also a pretty simple one, uh, can be a count vectorizer, uh, so you specify that you want to analyze words, as we saw before. And in this case, we want both uh, uh, engrams and biograms, so single words and a couple, a couple of words that are close to each other. So you see there is 14 and 14 MP, and then 19, 19 of February, and blah, blah, blah. How, how, how does it look like? Again, it's just a big, a big uh, vector of zeros and non-zeros values. But what you really want to use is a vectorized representation, as we said before. Uh, and a vectorized representation is only telling me the words that are different from zero. So in the first row, the column 135 is one, the column 219 is one, also 94, blah, 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 uh, till, uh, till the end of the vector, basically. Now I created uh, uh, from from GenSim in this time um, a, a different data set, so the um, fake news data set. 
if you do info on the data set on uh, GenScene, you have uh, all the metadata from that data set. And then you can start uh, visualizing what's in there. You have a uh, unique ID, uh, you have uh, author and so on. So what you want to do is at uh, the beginning, you might want to load this using pandas. Once you have uh, the pandas, you can count uh, how many values you have for each uh, categories, how many different types and plot it. So just some data visualization. After data visualization, you can apply a tokenizer as we uh, tokenizer we defined before. So how you divide the sentence into uh, different tokens. Uh, we do the cleaning. So in this case, I take my text, uh, I uh, access only the text part, I apply the tokenized transformation. This is more efficient uh, than going row by row. And then I apply the uh, something to remove the stop words. This is how it can be useful to have stop words in just a list, might be faster. And then I use the stammer. And again, in this case, for the stammer, I don't want to go line by line, but I want to go uh, to uh, work on uh, on vectors. And this is why I use the apply function. So I use to apply. This is much more efficient than also using the lambda. So inside, inside here, I could also do lambda x and then stem in x. Uh, so, sorry, yes, in this case. Um, but it's lower because uh, it's still going uh, uh, vector by vector in this case, lambda access vector by vector. But uh, in, if I use it this way, I will obtain the same thing, but on the uh, on the on the wall matrix. So I finally, with this, I obtain. Uh, uh, the data set I want, which is word and noun together. Sorry, word and, uh, and the post tag. Um, I'm gonna go fast here because this is the same concept I want to see. I want to show you how you can practically use the, the concept that we saw in, in one task. So as you can see, never work with the lists, always work with the pandas data frame. It's, cleaner and more efficient to do so. And then you can create uh, your own tokenizer. You have uh, access to stop words and so on. So something that may might have skipped at the beginning uh, is to, how do we create is it? Ah, this one. So how do we extend the uh, scikit-learn? Scikit-learn is a great library and the, the greatest thing is probably that you can easily uh, extend the functionality in a clean way. For example, what we want to use is a count vectorizer, but we want to specify our own tokenizer because uh, the tokenizer in count vectorizer is not uh, advanced enough, we need something more custom. Uh, so in this case, uh, we will uh, we will use uh, the um, we will use uh, the stem tokenizer class. We extend. We create a class that extend our port stammer. So I use as a tokenizer port stammer and. We only need to add two things: the init, uh, so we can uh, we can uh, automatically initialize the the stammer, and the call. So this is really when uh, is uh, we are actually calling the the function to to do the tokenization. And in this case, I'm using word tokenizer, which is uh, something from NLTK. Uh, so the tokenizer is doing this, but I also do the stemming inside this. 
uh, uh, this process, making things a bit more efficient and more clean. So if you want to go even further, you can create a, another uh, function inside this class that does uh, maybe the stemming or maybe does something else. And you can create a, a very neat way of, uh, of working with, um, with the count vectorizer or with TFIDF or whatever we do with the uh, inside learn. So this is not NLP specific, but uh, it, it really makes a difference uh, to work in this way. Again, if you want to use a different uh, tokenizer, we can have, have the lemma tokenizer instead of the uh, standing one. So we lemmatize each word. It's going to take much longer, uh, but you can have you can see um, how long it will take by just running this. But you also see the different in results. Great. So we saw this. Uh, and then it's time to say to move to the second part, which is, uh, I would skip topic extraction for now. I will start a bit with a little bit of re uh, recurrent neural networks, just because there are some concepts that are using, uh, are useful in, uh, in what we speak about ELMO. So we mentioned also ELMO and uh, a deep learning approach. Then we move to transfer learning. Then we will see the transformers. And if we have time, we will go back to topic extraction. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I have the chat in front of me. So happy to answer any question. If not, Let's go with the uh, recurrent neural network. Have you, are you guys familiar with uh, um, neural networks in general? Can you raise your hand if you're familiar with it and don't need uh, a refreshment? We have two people, three people raising their hands, four, five, Okay, quite a few. I would say half and half probably. Okay, so I will I will do it anyway because uh, yeah, some people are not that are not that familiar. But I think I would I I'll, I'll try to give an interesting spin also for people who who are familiar with that because there are a lot of different ways of looking at the same thing, and I will I will go a bit. Uh, not in the details of this, so we can go we can go faster. So, recurrent neural network. The first thing I should say is that RNN were the de facto uh, deep neural network method for uh, uh, for uh, NLP. Uh, a few years ago, that was made the best way to uh, process. Uh, uh, a, a, a task that had some uh, uh, time dependencies. And what I mean by this is that when I look at the at a word, uh, probably keeping in mind the, the word before will give me a lot of information. And this is why recurrent neural networks were useful because they are able to retain this information. That's the recursion part and use this information for, uh, for, uh, for in the network. But first of all is the perception. Uh, so how a neural network is created is basically uh, a switch. Uh, we have some inputs, we have some weights uh, that connects the input to the switch. And then based on the, um, on the sum of all the inputs times the weights, we determine if the switch should be turned on or off. So uh, should I, let the signal go or should I make the signal stop? The idea is that if I'm able to find the appropriate weight, I'm only looking at the important part of the image uh, and I will activate some neurons with a certain pattern. That means that when I create the final 
feature set, I can say that uh, neural one in layer one, uh, three in layer two, and five in layer six were activated with this uh, with this input. So those are my features, and uh, that means that uh, uh, I recognize these patterns. And the training is basically finding the, the appropriate weights. That's how you train a neural network. Then you have the standard feed forward neural network, just a bunch of, uh, as I said, a bunch of neurons that are one after the other. Recurrent neural networks uh, are solving uh, a, certain, um, a certain problem. Uh, in particular, uh, when I don't have a determine input size, like in a, in a sentence. The sentence can be two words, it can be uh, 30 words. Uh, it's, it's a bit unpredictable. How do you process that with a feed forward neural network? It's not so easy because you either pad everything, so you add zeros till you have a certain dimension, uh, or it becomes a bit difficult. Um, Recurrent neural network helps because they can process one word at a time, but they can maintain the context of the previous word. So that is extremely useful. Uh, and also it allows you to uh, capture the relationships across inputs uh, on different times. So if uh, convolutional neural network and feed forward are good with images, they are terrible with sequences. Uh, but uh, recurrent neural networks, they are kind of keeping in mind what happened before. So they, they are able to model sequences well, like time series or uh, voice uh, or uh, uh, NLP. And what happens is that we have this external, uh, sorry, additional recursion. So that additional recursion allows uh, the neuron to maintain something in memory, uh, previous input in memory. And this is how it looks in the, in the full neural network. So you have the neurons with this uh, auto connection. So we use this internal state to process the sequence of input and they remember things that learned from previous, previous input, which is uh, good. And, what you see here, the, what is circulating is not just the previous input, but is a computation of the previous input and all and other previous inputs. So you, you don't have just a memory of the, of the previous one, but also on a few previous ones. So handwriting recognition, speech recognition, time series are great for uh, uh, great for neural net, for recurrent neural networks. Deep speech is a revolutionizing arch architecture that was, I think, created by Mozilla or Google. I don't remember, but it was uh, intensively using recur recurrent neural networks. And um, I'm gonna spare you the details, but this is an interesting thing to see. And you see how, with time, the information is maintained in a recurrent neural network. So you have the first word. That's the only thing you know. Then you have the second word with still information about the first, and then the, the third with information about all the others, and so on and so on. So you can see you, you maintain the history, not just the previous input. And you do it in a complex way. There are some switches here that activate uh, using certain thresholds. So this is inside the neuron, how the memory works. Not going into the details, but it's basically more switches. Uh, that was the introduction, very quick, of uh, RNNs. Why did they went so quick? Because now it's basically demonstrated that uh, RNN uh, are worse than uh, uh, transforms architectures, for example. So. Uh, in, my, in the future might change. That's something you notice uh, often in machine learning that you see uh, an algorithm that seems the, the best one. Uh, and then in a five years time, uh, it's uh, 
kind of uh, forgotten. Uh, the time the time windows might might vary, but it happens to me with uh, neural networks. When I studied, they they were thinking the neural networks are not very good, uh, and they were praising super vector machines and other methods. And of course, the now the situation is extremely different. But I wouldn't be surprised if they find the different ways to use the recurrent neural networks in a more uh, e e e efficient way. So why, neuro why recurrent neural networks are still important? Because they are used in some of the uh, architecture we're going to see, especially in ELMO. Uh, but they are also used uh, to extract some embeddings. So if you want to have this final representation of, of our vector, uh, you can uh, uh, you would somehow use embed use uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, and now let's see um, a little bit about transfer learning. Um, actually, let's let's do this. Uh, Fifty one hour. Yes. So I think we have time to see practically a uh, recurrent neural network example. Um, uh, LSTM plus glove. Okay, I will do this after uh, after the embedding part because uh, I'm gonna use both. I think to create glove uh, the the network is actually a recurrent neural network to create the the vectors in glove. So this is why we have a, um, a, a, a an exercise with that. Everything clear? I know I was quite fast, but I think it's if it's if you have the wall, uh, if just the, the main ideas in our RNN, this is good enough. But uh, let me know in the chat if, uh, if that doesn't work. I see, uh, Mehdi, you have the hands raised. Do you, do you have a question? Or you just forgot it from before? Huh? Fine, yeah, happens to me as well. So I'm gonna share the, the presentation. Um, there is a, Adam has a question about the, the data, the only data uh, I have the folder with toxic comment classification challenge. Correct, that's the only data we have in there now. Um, I need to check uh, if it's the only data we need, uh, just because uh, there was a last minute change in the schedule and my, my um, Instead of having eight hours, I only had uh, the, the, this slot, so I had to cut a few things, and some things uh, are not 100% just because I didn't have enough time to, to, to double check. So I might need to add something, but it will not be that much. Uh, and, uh, but don't, don't worry about it for now. At the moment, you, uh, you have the right data. Uh, H-pitch classification, and uh, it should be the same, yes. Toxic comment. Um, sorry, which uh, which uh, notebooks are you talking about? Um, Adam? First one. Okay. Oops, notebook. Path uh, deep learning. Yeah, it's a slightly different one. Let me let me give you the uh, the data. So you have the right collab data uh, input. Mm. Um, 
I am sorry, I'm getting confused. It's here. So lab notebooks, deep learning. Um, I'm gonna share the, all of these so you have different. Um, change uh, anyone with the link. Okay, so here. There it is. So that's the additional data apologies for, for, for that. You see why you have some quite a few toxic messages because I think uh, now you should be able to find online an article of all, some work we did at Bumble. Yes, I, I can add in a slide, it's a good idea. Uh, I'll add it in the Jupyter notebook. Um, No problem at all. Uh, let's say save it. Oops. Cannot save changes. Ah. Yeah, this is just a different. Uh, one second, I will. Oops. I need to change the user. Uh, to modify it, so you can see this is my company's, my own company's on my private, my private one. So I use also with my the other people who work here. Uh, now I should be able to. Mm -hmm. Let's see what was the name. Uh, um, notebook. Okay, oops. Now we are in the right place. So I should be able to uh, add it here. Okay, saved. Thank you, Kanwar, to for to sharing the link. And uh, now you also are able to download the additional data set here. You should also download the glove, uh, which is the which is in uh, let's see speed classification test train. So the the other one is. Uh, um, is the glove representation that you find uh, in here. Ah, here is probably. Yes. So I also add this. OK. 
Okay, now we have uh, uh, Okay, now we also have the glove, the, um, the vectors, so it should all be fine. Great. So if you're all fine with that, now we can go to, to the second, uh, to, um, LSTM plus glove. So this part, that the, the, um, the second notebook that you're able to see, uh, lesson two text classification, is actually applying what we saw in a real case scenario. Again, I will leave this till the end, just because uh, it's mostly for you to uh, exercise on, on these topics, uh, but we already saw a little bit here and there. You see it's guided, complete here. Uh, you have also um, another, uh, another folder with uh, the solutions. So if you go in solutions, you'll be able to find the, uh, the things with all solutions. So I think it's something you can also, you can also do uh, at home. Uh, and uh, if there's something that goes wrong, you don't understand, feel free to message me. But because we are all, you're, a lot of you are interested in uh, the more advanced application, I will go, uh, I will skip this. So we go, exercise two is kind of homework, I say. Then we have uh, lesson uh, 4.1 LSTM and glove topic modeling. I will also. Um, skip it for now we we come back at the end if we have time um, so lstm for hate speech detection uh, download the content of this folder you should be able to just click on this and uh oh yeah that's where i have uh, hate speech and glove i already had it in there uh, so you need to download these two and put and put it in your own google drive or if you're running Jupyter Notebooks in your machine, put it in a, in a place where you can, uh, you can read it. And if you remember GLOVE, it's a simple lookup table, basically. You have a, a word, you look up the word, you see the vectorized representation of that word, and then you use that vector uh, as a way to represent your word. And this is a, a, a concept that you can do with uh, glove, word to vec, but also with BERT. You will see that we have uh, the, these more advanced deep learning models that are expanding um, the embedding uh, by giving context. So as I mentioned before, we have, let's say we have two words, help as a noun and help as a verb. They in here, in glove and, and, and word to vec, they are represented with the same vector. But that doesn't make sense if you, uh, if, if you think about it, because they are basically different words. Sometimes they are actually, they have completely different meaning. So what shall we do? Uh, we, we create embeddings with the context. And uh, BERT is able to create embeddings using the context. So instead of uh, one word, sorry, one embedding per word, you, you can have multiple embeddings per word and you decide which embedding to take based on the context. That's the gist of, uh, of it. So you can see just as a next step in the embedding evolution, but they are, all these techniques are, just, are mostly to find a, a good representation of our text. So when we, uh, I decided to have hate speech detection in a couple of, of exercises because uh, at Bumble I work on a hate speech detection uh, and uh, uh, you can also find articles online. Uh, I think the team uh, just released it in, in the app. So I, I was there for the initial part, but not for the, for the final one. It's a, 
interesting feature if you use uh, the app and you try to send something uh, not that nice or like hateful don't don't try i mean but you should be prompt uh, a suggestion to to think about it twice basically and uh, this has a, a a few problems some problems that we are not going to see in this course like how to deal with sparsity because likely that likely there are some uh, uh, toxic messages that are extremely rare, uh, but still you need to deal with them. Uh, and the other one is that uh, a message can contain multiple uh, uh, multiple flags, can be toxic, uh, uh, can be hate speech, uh, uh, it can be uh, uh, all sorts of things, can be a uh, um, uh, bad word. So it's not one label per instance, but it's a multi-label problem. Uh, so what you do is just load everything. As I can see here, I'm using uh, uh, Keras, and Keras also has some tokenizer features. It's not necessarily the best one, but uh, again, if you want, when you when you start, I always go as simple as possible, and then when I, I check when something is working decently fine, I start looking at each step and see which step will make the biggest impact. And then I try to work on that step. So usually I, I, I start with the easiest thing and then I modified piece by piece. I check that the results are improving and then I iterate through it. And for to do this is important to have a baseline. I think now I don't have a baseline here, but just because uh, to save a bit of time and, uh, and focus on you on, uh, on uh, the the glove part, but you should always start with the baseline. So now I'm just reading the, the content here. They're probably gonna ask me permission to read, to mount the ICHCL, yes. So here I'm just saying, I want to use the embedding with the, uh, the vector of uh, 50 numbers per word. This is the my embed size. We have the maximum amount of features, and we have the max len of the words that uh, we can have in a comment. I now, sorry, I now want to use uh, Google Drive as my uh, way of, of storing things. So I will need to get a permission. So what happens that you click on this, uh, you pick the account, click on sign in, and then uh, um, and then you you copy that code. You provide your allowed access. You shouldn't share these things, but at the end, if you only use it like me with the with this trail with this test data, it doesn't really matter. Um, and now I just want to check that uh, my system is able to see the 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 vectors so these are the embedding and also my, the folder with the data now that i have the data i want to read it so i read the with pandas uh, both csvs and then i and i check the classes that i i have so one word can be a toxic severe toxic obscene a threat an insult or ident identity eight so what I do here, I just uh, list these things and uh, fill uh, NA's, NA values. So where I don't have uh, an actual value with uh, this. It's slightly better than uh, leaving it blank because uh, if, you, if, I, if you don't put this, you will only have uh, NA value, which is actually a float. So it's a number. So you, you should... Uh, transform everything into a string. Uh, 
but because I feel uh, empty can be slightly different from NA, uh, this is why I put the, the, the NA value here. It's a bit more explicit as well. So now the, the more interesting part before was just reading the data. Now we have the tokenizer. You specify the maximum features that we said before, and then we do uh, tokenizer fit on texts. And again, this is uh, the Keras tokenizer. So if you have a GPU, it should be uh, it should it should work a bit faster. So by running this, I can create my I fit tokenizer. I then use the tokenizer to transform the train and test. Note that I use the tokenizer. I fit the tokenizer on the only on the train. And this is because if I if I did it on the whole data set, I might leak some information that my uh, test set shouldn't have. So you always need to pretend that the test set is like production data that was not used to train in any way the model, even with the process with the pre-processing part. So what I want to do after that is just uh, uh, reading the glove coefficient. So I just strip uh, some uh, unuseful part of, uh, of the embedding from the file. And I want to transform this into uh, a dictionary when I have the word uh, on one side. So this is the, the clean word. And uh, uh, on the other side, I want to have the embedding. So now it's basically loading the embedding file in a more efficient uh, data structure in memory. If it's too big, you can use out of memory uh, dictionaries. So now what we, what we want to do is to stack the embeddings. Uh, now what we basically have is every, instead of having a word, we have a vector of 50 values. And now we can use these values uh, to gain some information about the sentence. I will use it in a very simple way now. I'm just gonna take the mean of all the embeddings. So this is what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm creating, instead of a sentence, I'm transforming that in the mean of all the embeddings that the sentence has. And now this is where the LSTM comes, uh, comes into play. So I create an LSTM, uh, sorry, um, a recurrent neural network with an LSTM uh, uh, memory. So LSTM stands for long short, long short term memory, which is the one of the possible way to do to have the recursion. Um, and what do I want to obtain out of this? I just want to. Uh, uh, to see how the how the how the predictions perform. So now it was gonna take up a, a little bit if you want to uh, if you want to run everything, but basically all this is doing is like later I'm creating a neural network. Uh, I am uh, uh, compiling with categorical cross entropy because we have multiple categories. In this case, one category was excluding the others, not in my real world case. Um, but yeah, I basically train a neural network to use the embedding as an input. Uh, so I use this uh, as a classifier. And uh, as you can see, I create, I'm creating the embedding here. So I can also do the other, the other way around. I can also transform this with the uh, count vectorizer and then 
get the embedding out of my own my own uh, neural network. So after you run this, after a little bit, of course, you need to fit the model. You will see that uh, uh, the uh, you start to have a, a, a bit higher accuracy, uh, and uh, despite being a very rough approach, you have some. Uh, uh, some, some decent results. And I want you to compare this with uh, another approach, which is just a classification using embedding. So before we, we, we used embedding as a, in two ways, we use it before to create a representation of the, of the words and the sentences and then after we use it by simply um, creating a classifier that is using embedding to, to make the classification. Now, uh, what I'm showing here is how to use the uh, embedding in a, with a different classifier. So as we did before, exactly the same thing. I'm loading the embedding and transforming the word uh, yes, yeah, so here you also you only need to add uh, the how to read the from from the how to read the, from the Google Drive. So if you just copy this, it should be fine. I'm gonna put it in my four point two. Because otherwise, it doesn't find these uh, these files. Um, four point two. So now we need to give permission. Uh, check this. Sign in. I get the. I get this and uh, there should be enough to authorize everything. Now we need to still add the this file as the file with the with the data, so let's check if we need it. Yeah, so we need to just change this. Mm -hmm. Should be enough. So it's exactly the same as before. Basically, we use the glove B with the the fifty one. The word vector, I just picked 50. Uh, and um, I use the, the glove to get to transform words into vectors. And now uh, use a different data set. And I create uh, my embedding for the, the sentence. Because now I have a word, but what about uh, the whole sentence? So what I do here is that with this uh, embedding vectorizer that I can use in scikit-learn, uh, I have a class that has uh, three main things, the init to initialize the word to vec, but actually, yeah, this was not, this will not use this now. Uh, the, the fit and the transform is extremely important because this will be part of a pipeline of a scikit-learn pipeline. So we need to have fit and transform. Fit will not do anything, but we just need it for the pipeline. Uh, and then we have the transform that is actually transforming the document into, uh, into uh, numerical vectors. So 
for each word in the document, I transform this word into a, 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 the vector. If there is no word, I then uh, just fill it with zeros. I uh, maintain a list of all the, the, uh, the vectors I encountered. So basically containing a list of the uh, vector representation of all the words I encountered. And then I take the mean of those. So it means that every word will be represented by one vector. Sorry, every sentence will be represented by one vector. And then I use a um, I use a, a, a random classifier uh, to classify things based on that vector. So I take the random forest classifier, sorry, not random classifier, random forest classifier. Um, I transform uh, the, the sentences into vectors. And then uh, I predict and I create my uh, AUC score and a confusion matrix. As you can see, it's not ideal. So we, are need, we need to predict uh, which documents are from a uh, uh, atheist uh, uh, newsletter and which are from the uh, uh, space newsletter. So it's a binary classification. Uh, you, you can see from the from both the AOC score and the confusion matrix that we it's, it's decent. So the confusion matrix is telling how many uh, positive we have and how many negative we have. This is uh, these are the true positive, and these are the true negative, which means the correct uh, uh, predictions that our algorithm did, and these are the mistakes. So you can see that it's not great, but it still works fine. So now, what I will ask you quickly to do uh, is to uh, maybe not, not even uh, do the exercise because we don't have that much time, um, but just propose some, uh, propose some ways of improving this simple algorithm. So what would you do to improve this? And uh, I will leave, uh, let's say, uh, five minutes um yeah five minutes for uh for that uh and also break so if you're tired just have a break if you have uh time uh do this and uh, we start back at 6 30. sorry uh don't know where you are so uh something 30 in, in uk is uh, 6 30 probably in uh, india and uh, uh um canada a different time but in uh seven in seven minutes now. I'll be out, away from keyboard, but I will answer your question as soon as possible. Feel free to answer. Uh, thank you. That were very, very kind. Appreciate it. Yes, so we have two, two questions. Um, uh, never mind that. So, oh yeah, I will, will ignore the Ryan's question. Um, hey, TA is asking, can you please talk uh, about tuning the hyperparameters for a word embedding model? Uh, can tuning change the embedding model's performance significantly? Uh, yes. Uh, maybe the question is which, which embedding? So they are some sort of embedding they are called in different ways which for example what we see now transformers uh, that are definitely much more effective uh, if uh, if we if we tune them a little bit for other embeddings for example word to vec you can tune them a little bit and what we would do you basically adding layers uh, on the uh, on neural networks that um, that you can obtain for word to vec or for glove. So by adding layers, you can fine tune the the network a little bit. I can show you. 
a good nice presentation for that uh, maybe here um, so just quickly I think it's very very good to visualize this I don't know if you um, to remember I am doing too many courses um, what's the one with deep learning what the Uh, this so this is for managers. I, I think I got it. This one here. So embedding is not actually just for uh, uh, for text. It's a very very generic uh, generic idea, and it's a, a gen idea that comes with the neural network architecture. So what you usually do to train, to fine tune things, uh, am I sharing the, the screen? Can you all see? See, you're sharing screen. Great, thank you. Fantastic. So um, you, you have different strategy to fine tune uh, uh, embeddings and neural networks in general. You can either, uh, cut the neural network. So you train a neural network for one task. You take out the softbox and probably the one fully connected layer. And then you use uh, that as a, as a way to extract features. And this is the embedding part because this fully connected layer is the embedding. Now you create a, you put an input like a word uh, and here you're gonna have uh, 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 a one uh, dimensional vector of numbers. So this is exactly word to vec or, a, or glove uh, in a algorithmic way, but you can also do the, the other way around just with the word and embedding. So we know this, this is what we do at the moment. Something else you can do instead of when you cut the fully connected layer, you can add another fully connected layer and another soft max. So in this case, you are still using the embedding, uh, but you are fine tuning this on, uh, on your specific task. And uh, in Keras, TensorFlow, whatever you prefer to use, there is the options of freezing part of the network. So uh, you're, you're, let's say you start with a network already trained for some task this, this year, maybe on Wikipedia. Uh, now you want to train only these two layers. So you tell TensorFlow or Keras to freeze these layers uh, and then only train the other two. So here you're able to fine tune uh, your, uh, your embeddings uh, or your classification. You can directly use this for classification. Um, and this is how you can fine tune the embeddings, basically. Just treat it as a neural network and add, add layers, uh, make it uh, more relevant to your, uh, to your uh, uh, work. War, war. Um, now, let's start, let's go back to this. Uh, because something else we, we can do in the embedding space is to, uh, have um, a decoder and, and an encoder uh, to be able to uh, uh, create this part here, which is uh, an embedding. So you still have a neural network. The, the goal of this neural network is to recreate the input. And the difficulty is that we are cutting out a lot of the features in here. So if you have uh, an input of uh, uh, 32 times 32, a matrix, uh, this large, then you have a network, uh, a vector in the middle uh, of um, eight by one, for example, 
uh, and then uh, at the, the output will be another maxis of 32 times 32. What you want to be able to do is to recreate a, uh, your inputs. So you have a, an image here, let's say an image of a number. You pass this image to our input. Uh, they, the first, the encoder here shrinks the input to a very small uh, uh, set of values. And then the other part of the network try to reconstruct the input based on these values. So now this is a concept that you was used in uh, uh, many places like generative networks, uh, um, compression. I mean, there, there are a lot of applications, but it's the, also the concept that uh, stands at the very foundations of the transformers, which is the most maybe modern and uh, successful uh, architecture that we have at the moment. So you see, you see uh, basically what we want to obtain is like a set of transferable features that describe uh, a bus, a person, anything with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a vector. Once we have that vector, we, we don't care that if we are comparing people, if you are comparing uh, um, buses, anything. Uh, you can do a cosine similarity uh, and then you can get one number that represent how similar two faces are, for example, which is another project I work on. And the other, in, the other cool part is that uh, you can use the vector. So you translate this word in this vector, the color represents the number. Uh, and you can see how king and man share some characteristics like this is shared is also shared with woman uh, you have a little bit shared in here what with woman is different uh, and then you can recognize the man and woman have similar in here what king is more different so what does it mean it means that you can start doing the operation i was talking about so if you do king minus man plus woman it should be equal to queen and then left here um a visualization to actually let you check how similar these things are. So if you do king plus man, sorry, minus man plus woman, you see there are some differences, but they are very similar, I would say. And we do the same thing for uh, for our uh, um, for our models. Uh, so if we have a uh, we, we, we have an input, we look up the embeddings, we sum some prediction and we output this prediction. This is the, what we, we saw so far. Now, the main problem with this type of embedding here is that one word can represent multiple things. Uh, in, in an image is different. In an image, a car should always be classified as a car. Uh, you have less ambiguity. So for, uh, for words, this is basically word to vec or glove. But if we also are able to create context and use the context to inform the embedding, then we are able to uh, open a world of possibility that we, had, we didn't have before. So let's see, now we, we jump back to our presentation and uh, we jump back to word embeddings and uh, transformers. Uh, let's close this. So let me share with you the current presentation, which is this one here. I'll put it in the chat. I take out, that doesn't have the user. Um, yeah, Jeff, uh, you don't see it because uh, it was part of a different presentation. I just use it for the um, for the to to explain uh, that specific.
the specific retraining question that uh, that I had, but I can share it with you if you're interested. Uh, Uh, let's say I was just share it. So the one I share now is not the one I will present. Uh, just put it as extra reading. So I don't want to confuse, but extra readings is not something I will present now. It's just something I, I just to explain uh, the, um, the 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 retraining one. What we are gonna check now is the no problem is the other one, the transformers. This is where it's it's a bit more relevant to NLP. This is why I want to go with this presentation. So transformers in general are quite of a complex topic. What I will do now is just give a, a um, helicopter vision on the main uh, on the main differences, uh, encoder, the coders, encoder, the coders. Then we see some code, and I will. I want to leave the last few minutes for questions. So this is the very high level vision on what transformers are. It's very related to what we just saw. So in any task, we have. Uh, Supervise NLP, we have input features. We need to find the representation. Then we need to find something to classify, to use this classification to representation to classify uh, our, our, our inputs. And as we said before, BERT can be used as a representation, word to vec, glove, and then a classifier. This classifier can be part of BERT if we want to. It can be mix and match with different algorithms. And this is also the important part. But what is BERT exactly? It's not just a funny character with a big red nose. It's also uh, a, a set of, of innovations that are able to encode sequences in, um, in a context aware way. So let, let's see. Uh, Let's see, let's see why. So we have uh, two main architectures. We have the encoder architecture, the decoder architecture, and then one that is derived by these two, which is the encoder decoder. The decoder architecture is what we saw before in that example where we are compressing things. Uh, so it's the first part of that network. In, in NLP in particular, you want uh, uh, a decoder to transform uh, a text in uh, embeddings. So what, that's what we saw before. Why we have a different name now? We have a different name because uh, the real innovation that we had was self-attention. Self-attention is a mechanism uh, that helps training uh, by focusing on the most relevant uh, part. If you remember, recurrent neural network kept a memory of, uh, of the previous inputs, but really didn't know how much relevant it was. It was a, a bit of a, um, uh, of a kind of a summary of everything that happened before. With self-attention, the network is focusing on the features that are uh, more important. So it's basically a, a, a very good uh, feature selection and feature engineering part. We create weights uh, for the feature that are more important. How is that obtained? Is obtained by encoding the whole sentence. So if you're able to access uh, everything and then create like the, the full sentence and then create an encoding. Um, encoders are a great, uh, a great solution. What happens is that uh, you create uh, from one, uh, sorry, I just need to change this slide. Um,
so you create a representation out of each word and but this representation will be context aware because the self attention mechanism is able to inform the embedding on the context of uh, of the word and this is this is what the, the bird architecture uh, and the BERT architecture has a few different architecture in it, BERT, Roberta, Excel, Rob, and, uh, and many others. So you need a bi-directional access. You need uh, to be able to read left and right the whole sentence. Uh, you're able to extract meaningful information. Uh, so it can be good for, uh, uh, if you have multi-label classification, when you have a lot of labels, for example, Question answering, a text summarization, everything is great for, uh, for this type of architecture. Then we have the decoder architecture that is quite similar, but you use mask self attention. So in this case, you don't have access to the full word, but you only have access to the, the, the words you saw so far. So in here, you need to have a sequence and uh, a sequence, you, you can find these, uh, these sequences in uh, speech, for example, in online classification where things are just streaming. Um, in everything that does not know what the, refuge, the future will, uh, will provide us. But again, uh, you also create a vectorized representation of, uh, of, the, of, of the words. How is it used? It's used for any un undirectional access, so unidirectional access. Uh, so for example, online, you have a speech uh, recognition. Um, it can also be used for generation because uh, generation, uh, e natural language generation usually is a problem where you provide the beginning of a sentence of a paragraph, and then the algorithm is to complete the rest. So an example is GPT-2. Um, and then we have the encoder decoder architecture, which is really getting the best of both words and providing the context of, uh, of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the word in the, in the best possible way. So the, the, the encoder is used to get uh, uh, global informations and the decoder is used to translate a sequences of event to another sequences of event. The self-attention mechanism was created by uh, focusing on this task in sequence to sequence, how to transform a sequence of event in another sequence of events. Simple example is uh, uh, translating uh, uh, a document from uh, English to French. So, uh, I'm speaking and the, the, the systems need to translate automatically. How do we do it? First, we have the encoder. The encoder has uh, a global knowledge of uh, maybe on the, on, the, on the language or maybe he already knows the, the full word I, I said. Sorry, the full sentence. So the word will create uh, uh, the embeddings. The embedding will be uh, very specific to uh, what we created so far. And those embeddings will be feeded in our decoders. Then the decoder will also be fed with the, the sequence. And then we, we provide an input. So encoder provides smart embeddings. Decoder takes care of the sequence to sequence translation. So we have on the decoder bidirectional self-attention and uh, on the decoder unidirectional and mask self-attention. And uh, the, 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 the cool peculiarity of this is that, uh, okay, the decoder creates a vector, the encoder the sequence to sequence, uh, but we can also mix and match. So we can take the best encoder and the best decoder. Uh, we can take, uh, the uh, BERT encoder and uh, um, let's say GPT-2 decoder or BERT encoder and BERT decoder because BERT has both. 
uh, and uh, the, the important part is that they don't share weights. And if you remember what we said at the beginning of the generative of what is maybe the most important discovery on the, of the past 10 years in machine learning is exactly this, is separating the loss function to the um, of loss function from the uh, classification function. Now it's much more muddy here in how the decoder and the coder are, are, are doing this task, but again, is the same concept. We solve two separate problems in, uh, in, 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 in two different ways, and then we can uh, mix and match different solution that we found on problems uh, that are not as necessarily related. Uh, so I left uh, the last uh, example. I will just go very quickly with uh, on the decoders. So here I have a bit, we have a bit of theory if you're more interested in uh, what's happening under, under the hood. But we also have an exercise um, Uh, sorry. Yes, here. No, just need to close some windows. So this is the collab, the last Google collab. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the question. I will just quickly finish this and then go with the questions. I'm not just going to finish. I'm just going to give an overview on what's happening here. So what's happening here is the, the um, using a BERT uh, to fine tune, uh, basically fine tune BERT on, uh, on a specific uh, task. And this is a bit of a lot of the question were about like, fine-tuning the, the language models. This is how you fine-tune BERT, for example. Um, so you, we have a task, we have some pre-trained embeddings, and then we retrain part of the embeddings, part of this network uh, on our task. And this is possible because we have this separation in encoder-decoder. So the, the encoder can be the, the, the embeddings that we already created, and that the coder the, de the decoder can be the, the part that we fine tune uh, with our data set. In this case, it's more messy. So training, you need to fine tune with, uh, with, uh, with the network itself. Uh, and it's not as clean as scikit-learn as you can see, uh, but in any case is uh, getting the job done. So I know we, we, we're running out of time and I want to answer some questions. So these, these are the main concept. There is a trans, the transform and notebook. Uh, there is the, uh, the other hugging face notebook, which has a bit of theory. If that is not enough, please, please send me a message and I'm happy to answer your, your, your question um, even after the, the training is over. Going to the questions, I have one for Jeff, from Jeff. Uh, could you repeat the innovation uh, by separating the loss function from which other function? Um, the innovation is basically making the loss function trainable. Uh, so in like normal machine learning, traditional machine learning, you decide the loss function and the loss function is uh, whatever function you decide to, to measure your error uh, while training the algorithm. Uh, but it's not something you can learn. It's just basically measuring the distance between your prediction and the prediction of the algorithm. Wouldn't be nice to have a, a custom function uh, 
uh, that is actually loss function is actually trained for our for our own task because sometimes uh, some mistakes should be counted less than others. Uh, and this is what uh, what the generative adversarial network are are doing. And uh, uh, what generative uh, uh, networks are also able to do are able to train these things separately. So you can train a, a, gen a classification algorithm and then train separately your uh, uh, loss function. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kanwar, again about the out user ID. I always forget to, to check it. But basically, this is the separation. Making the uh, loss function trainable is an unbelievable uh, achieve, uh, unbelievable, not achievement, but uh, uh, able to unlock so many things in the generative part, in the representation part, uh, in, uh, in, in a lot of the of the innovation we, we see today, machine learning is because of uh, of this. No problem, Jeff. If you have any other question, I'm fine. I can stay a bit longer. Anyone else? You can also raise your hand and uh, ask your question. Ah, Ryan, I see. Do you have a question? Yes. Could you could you resend the link to the notebook? It's sure. Oh wait, I didn't see it. Sorry. I don't know, problem. Yeah, I think the last one was from uh, a Canwar sent the right uh, the right link. Are you able to use it? Yes, I, I got it. I, I just Perfect. didn't see it. Yeah, I don't know. it's a bit messy with the, with the chat, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Chiki, for being part of it. And uh, thank you so much for, for the kind words. Well, thank you very much, Leo. It's, it was a fantastic presentation and great quality of um, uh, information uh, you gave and the workshop is a success one. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. And feel free to connect on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to, uh, to have you in yes, the network. Sure. Thank yeah. you so much for, for attending and have a great continuation. Thank you. Thank you once again, Leo. Thank you so much.